Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hi everyone, Trish Connor Cato here. Welcome to Microsoft Project 2021. This video is for users who are looking to gain skills in Microsoft Project to create, administer, monitor, and report on a project plan's progress. Project is a powerful scheduling tool used to track tasks, resources, and costs. It also provides powerful and interactive reporting tools used through each stage of a project, as you will see during the course. We'll start with a brief review of project management concepts. Although Microsoft Project is used by project managers, it's also widely used by anyone in a position that requires tracking a schedule. It is useful to know how project management concepts correlate to the way plan files are created and administered in the application. We'll move on to become comfortable in the project environment, learning how to navigate around so you'll be acclimated to that environment. We'll dive into creating a project plan file, defining a project, and assigning a project calendar. Then we will begin to create and organize tasks. We will manually enter tasks into project as well as import some from another application. We will organize our tasks by creating a work breakdown structure, defining task relationships, and scheduling tasks. All of this occurs in the first module. In the second module, we'll focus on managing project plan resources and finalizing a project plan. We'll start by adding resources to a project plan, creating a resource calendar, entering resource cost, and assigning resources to tasks. We'll also learn how to effectively manage resource conflicts. We'll end this module by optimizing our project plan, setting a baseline, and sharing the plan. Our first module consists of three lessons. Lesson one is getting started, where we'll go over project management concepts, and you'll learn how to navigate the project environment. Our second lesson is defining a project, where we'll create a project plan from scratch, define the project, and assign a project calendar. And then our final lesson in this module is creating and organizing our tasks. We'll be adding tasks to our project plan. We'll also import tasks from other programs. Specifically, there is an Excel file in the video description named tasks for import that we'll be using. So before we get started in this lesson, you might wanna go ahead and grab that file and put it somewhere in your system for easy access. Then we'll move on to creating a work breakdown structure. It is a way of organizing your tasks. It's known commonly as WBS. We'll define task relationships and schedule tasks. The first phase of project management is conception and initiation. And that's the phase where the purpose of the project is determined, whether it can be done or not, and what would be needed for a successful completion. We're not gonna be covering that phase of project management in this course. We'll start with the definition and planning phase, which really lines up with how you're gonna be working in Microsoft Project. And this is where you determine the scope of the project and the budget. You set up your work breakdown structure, which organize your tasks and you look at risk management techniques that you may need to implement at any point in the project. Then you move on to the launch and execution phase. This is where you're tracking the status of your project. You're updating your tasks, your resource assignments and schedules, and you're reporting on status to your project stakeholders. The next phase is performance and control. And this is where you are checking to make sure that your objectives are on track. And if not, what tools can you use to get them back on track if possible? 
whether the deliverables, the end results are of quality. You're also going to be doing effort and cost tracking as well as performance of the overall project. And then you have the project close phase, which typically consists of some sort of post-mortem where you go over lessons learned and the end of project reporting. I've launched project and I'm sitting on the welcoming screen and I'm going to just click on blank project under the new heading so that it takes us into the interface. And this is where I'm going to give you the grand tour. So I'm going to start at the very top of the screen where it says project run project professional. Of course, every window has a title bar and that's what you're seeing there to the right. You have your login information and your traditional window management buttons. I always like to point out that when you have two X's, one on the top and one on the bottom, the top one controls the application. The bottom one controls the current file. To the left of your title bar, you have a little bit of a quick access toolbar, which can be customized like in all your other Microsoft programs. There is a useful thing that we'll be using throughout the course. So I'm going to show you one way to customize that quick access toolbar. And so we're going to go to the project tab on the ribbon. And in the properties group, you'll see several different icons and the group names are at the bottom. So in the properties group, we're looking for the project information icon. And what you're going to do is you're going to right click on it and choose add to quick access toolbar. So now that project information dialog box can be easily accessed from the quick access toolbar and we'll be using it several times throughout the course. So that's a good place for it. The project ribbon starts with your task tab. Everything pretty much that you need to do about tasks can be done from this tab. You have a resource tab and the same is true here. Anything having to do with your resource could potentially be handled from this ribbon tab. You have a report tab. So we mentioned in the introduction that you have these built in interactive reports. This is where you can access them as well as visual reports, and you can create your own custom reports from this ribbon tab as well. Your project tab is an overall tab. We'll be using multiple things on this tab throughout the course, and it's where you can find spell check by the way. You have a view tab where you have lots of different views in project. Sometimes when you're new to project, it can be overwhelming, but what you'll find are the views that are useful for you and you'll learn how to customize them as necessary. You have a help tab on the ribbon, everything about help or giving feedback about the program, finding out what's new in this particular version of project versus previous versions. And because when we selected a new blank project, the default view is Gantt chart with timeline. So you get that contextual tab on your ribbon, which is the Gantt chart format tab. That tab is there because of the view we're in. To the right of that, you have another way of navigating the program or getting help. And that's your tell me what you want to do box. And underneath your ribbon, this default view is called Gantt chart with timeline. So you have a timeline that's a good high level reporting tool or good for you. If you're managing the project plan, it's a quick at a glance of where your project is, as you'll see when we populate it throughout the course. Underneath your timeline, you have a split screen on the left side of the screen you have what's known as the entry table. And on the right side of your screen, you have your Gantt chart, which when populated will be a visual representation of your task duration, as well as some other things about your tasks. So you'll see how these views change as we populate 
when we start working on our project. To the left of your table, you have a view indicator. And that's where it says currently Gantt chart. That's the view that we're currently in. So the view indicator says Gantt chart. Now you can use the view menu to change the different views, or you can right click on that view indicator and you'll see other views that you can switch to. All the way at the bottom of the screen in the gray band, you'll see, and in my case, it starts with the word ready down there. And that whole gray area is called your status bar all the way at the bottom. So it tells you that it's ready. So if you wanted to start putting in things into your project plan file, you could. It lets you know that new tasks are manually scheduled down there, which you'll learn about shortly. And over to the right side, you have a series of view buttons kind of shortcuts that you can use instead of using the view indicator or the view tab of the ribbon, you have five different views that you can switch to by using those buttons. So the first one is kind of shaded already. That's our default view, the view you're currently in Gantt chart. You can get to task usage, team planner, resource sheet, and blank report views from there. And then finally to the right, you have a zoom slider. Now it doesn't function in here the way it does in Excel and in Word where it increases the size of your font on the screen for easier viewing. And here, if you look above the Gantt chart portion of your screen, you have what's known as a time scales. When you're in this view and you use the zoom slider, it changes the time scale. It does nothing to zoom your text in so it's larger or smaller. The type of project plan that we're going to be working on during this course is the rollout of a training initiative. So it could be that your company is getting a new piece of proprietary software and everyone or most people need to be trained on it. Or it could be that your company wants everyone trained on Microsoft Project and they need to roll out this initiative so the training is conducted appropriately. So we could use this new blank template that we created before, but let's just go to the file tab of the ribbon and on the left side, click on new. And we'll just start with another new blank project. So now you see it has project two up in the title bar. If we had closed project and went back in and did new, we would get project one again. We hadn't saved it or named it. So that's kind of how that works. It will just keep assigning sequential numbers until you give it a name. Now, a best practice here is to set up your project plan file before actual work starts on your project. Now we know in the real world, that's not always possible, but if you can aim toward that, that is a best practice. Now, when you first set up your project plan file, you need to define your project. And that means that you have to set the way that the project is going to be scheduled and either it's start or finish date. And so we're gonna do that from that project information dialog box. And we put it up on our quick access toolbar. If you didn't get it up there, it resides on the project tab of the ribbon in the properties group. Whichever way you want to access it, you can. Now notice in this project information for project two dialog box, it has the finish date dimmed out, can't access the finish date field. And that's because the project by default is scheduled from its start date. And let's just have a brief conversation about that for a moment. There's only two ways you can schedule your project from its start date or finish date. Now you might think, okay, well, I have this project plan and let's say it has a deadline of October 31st. You might want to schedule it from the finish date and put in October 31st. But in the background, project does reverse logic in a lot of areas. So for example, 
It defaults to being scheduled from the project start date. And right underneath that, it says all tasks begin as soon as possible. If you schedule it from the finish date, then it changes that constraint to all tasks begin as late as possible. And that could actually end up jamming you up in your project schedule. So I typically recommend scheduling from your project start date. There are things that you'll learn throughout the course. Let's say using October 31st as a prospective end date again. Let's say you get to a certain point in your project that you scheduled from the start date and you realize that you may not make your end date. There are ways that you can, it's called crashing your schedule. So you can gain some time back in your plan that could potentially help you meet that end date, even if you're scheduling from the start date. So for our start date, what we're going to do here is I'm going to just choose the following Monday from whatever date I'm currently on as the start date of this project. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the next day as the start date of my project here. And we also... So let's, let me do this one step at a time. We put in the next day as our start date and we're going to click OK. And a couple of things changed on your screen. First of all, if you look over on the right at the Gantt chart portion of your screen, you now have a vertical line that's going down the current where your current date is. And to the right of that, you have a dotted vertical line that indicates your project start date. Also, this task zero that showed up, and that's a default setting. If you don't have it, I'll tell you shortly how to get that default task there. That also updated to the start date that you set. Now I'm gonna show you how to control whether this default task shows up. And so one way we can control it, it's set as a default in my options, but we can go to that Gantt chart format tab and over to the right in the show hide group, you'll see that project summary task is checked. What I'm gonna do for right now is uncheck it. And we'll talk about the project summary task a little bit later in the course, but we don't need to have it there right now. After you've set a start date or finish date for your project, you're going to want to assign a project calendar. The project calendar lists all the exceptions, so days that no work will happen on the project. This is not like an Outlook calendar where you can import the holidays and stuff like that. You have to manually enter them. But the good news is if you set up a project calendar and you have other projects that are going to be using that same calendar or those same exceptions, you can actually share that calendar across different project plans. And you'll learn how to do that later in the course. For right now, we're going to go ahead and set up our project calendar. And we're going to go to the project tab of the ribbon. And in that properties group, we're going to click on change working time. And so project has three built in calendars. If you look up at the top of the change working time dialog box, there's a four calendar box and it's set to the standard project calendar. So your standard project calendar is for uh, standard working times of eight to five. So eight to noon and then an hour off for lunch and one to five, as you'll see on the right side of that screen. So that is a built-in calendar. If I go to the drop down arrow next to where it says standard project calendar, you'll see that there's also a night shift calendar that's built in. And that goes from 11 at night. Well, it says it has for June 20th, it has one hour. No, 11 p.m. to 12 a.m. the next day. So we can adjust the hours for that. But if you have a project where people are working 
on different shifts and there is a night shift, you can base it off of that calendar. And then you have your 24 hour calendar and no, we don't work people 24 hours. However, you might have equipment that is running continuously on your project and a 24 hour calendar could be assigned to it. So you have these three built-in calendars, but you really don't want to use any of them. You want to leave those alone and intact. We're going to go to the drop down and switch back to standard project calendar. And over to the right, we're going to choose create new calendar. And we're going to make it a copy. It's going to be based off of that copy of standard. So eight to five with an hour break for lunch. And we're going to give it a name. And we'll just call it training rollout, training rollout initiative, and we'll click OK. So by default, when project schedules work, it never schedules on a weekend. Now you can override that if necessary, but it will never schedule on a Saturday or a Sunday. So what we need to do for our training rollout initiative calendar is put exceptions on there for days that we know no work is going to happen with the exception of the weekends. So if I look at this mini calendar, if I do the down arrow to scroll down, it will take me to the following month. And so we'll notice that Independence Day is on July 4th. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the 4th of July on that mini calendar. And then in, on the lower half of the screen, you have two tabs, exceptions and work weeks. We're on the exceptions tab. And in the name box, we're gonna just type Independence Day. And when you press your tab key, it will populate the start and the finish dates for July 4th because we selected it on the calendar. Now, if you click on the next name line underneath Independence Day and then back on Independence Day, you'll notice that the details button on the right side will become available to you. Go ahead and click details. And this is where you can set up Independence Day as recurring. So underneath recurrence pattern, we're gonna select the option button in front of yearly, and we're gonna put, we'll leave it on July 4th. And then what I usually do, you can end after a certain amount of occurrences. I'm gonna choose end by, and I'm gonna change the year 22 to the year, mm, I'm gonna change it to the year 2050, so 50 and then click OK. So somewhere far out, so I don't have to worry about it. So that's our first exception. If you look at the little mini calendar again, you'll see that July 4th, right? It tells you it's a non-working day. It's based on the particular exception of Independence Day on the calendar. So now let's navigate our little mini calendar and let's go to September. And we're gonna do September 5th. Make sure that date is selected. Put in Labor Day as an exception on the next name line and tab. Click away from the line and back on it so you can get to details. And make that recurring yearly on the first Monday of September and end it in the year 2050, the recurrence. And those are the two exceptions we'll put on. And again, later you can okay your way out of there. Later on in the course, you'll learn how that calendar can be utilized by other project plans. So you don't always have to recreate the wheel. Once you've added the exceptions to your calendar, we just need to tell your project plan file to use that calendar. And we're gonna go back to our project information icon on the quick access toolbar to do that. On the right side of the project information dialog box, you'll notice the calendar defaults to the standard calendar, 
We're going to do the drop down next to standard and choose training rollout initiative and click OK. So it won't assign any work on the project for the 4th of July or for Labor Day based on the exceptions that we put on our calendar. Before we start manually entering tasks into our project plan file, we should probably go ahead and save the work that we've done so far. So I'm going to go ahead and you can click the save icon or go to file, save or save as. It's going to take you to save as. I'm going to browse for where I want to place this. And I'm going to just navigate to where I want to place my project plan file. And I'm going to name it training rollout initiative and save it. So now of course our title bar updated with the proper name for our file and we're ready to start manually entering tasks. Now there are two modes, if you will, when you enter tasks, there's manually scheduled. And earlier I pointed out that it says that new tasks are by default manually scheduled. And then there's the automatic schedule. If I click down there, I can auto schedule new tasks. We're going to leave it on manually scheduled right now. Manually scheduled gives us the ability to put placeholder text for a task duration, start or finish date. So typically you're entering your, you're starting your project plan file well before work starts on your project. You may not quite have all the information. So, you want to give yourself the ability to put placeholder text. And then before work starts on the project, I always switch it to an automatic schedule. And then that way project takes over the scheduling. Right now we're going to enter our task names and durations. And so if we look at our column headings in our entry table, we have an informational column. We have a task mode column and you'll see the indicator for a manually scheduled task there in a moment. We have task name duration, start, finish, predecessors, resource names. We'll deal with start, finish, predecessors and resource names later. For right now, we're going to click in the first task name cell. And you want your task names to be fairly short noun verb combinations. So we're going to type define project objectives and describe mission statement and press enter. So, and you could have pressed tab. I'll go back up arrow. You could press tab to get over to duration. The default unit for a duration is days. So you don't have to type the D, which would normally represent days if the duration is in days. In that duration cell, we're going to type the number two and press enter. And notice how it gives it days. Now, a couple of things happened. I want to direct your attention to the task mode column. And the push pin with the question mark is indicative of a manually scheduled task. There's only two modes, manual and auto. If you look over at your Gantt chart, you have a bar on your Gantt chart that is representing the duration of the task, which is two days. If you hover over that bar, it will give you a screen tip that says duration only. And the task start date is the date that we set our project to start on. It's finished date is the following day because we made the duration two days. Let's put our next task in. The next one is ensure total participation by training team and support staff. And I'm going to tab after that one. And that's a one day duration. So I'm going to just type the number one and press enter. 
We're going to add several more tasks at this point. I'm going to go ahead and get them entered in. And then when I resume, you'll see them and you can copy them from my screen. I've completed our initial task list and I've widened the task name column so it doesn't word wrap. So you're going to complete the other entries on this list on your own. So now I'm showing the task for import Excel file that's in the video description. And the file has two tabs. The first tab, the manually enter tab, those are the tasks that we've already entered into project. Now we have another tab at the bottom, the import tab, and we're actually going to use this tab to bring the rest of the project plan tasks into the file. Now we don't need to import the task ID that's in column A. So I'm going to just click in cell B1, hold down my shift and my control keys. I'm going to tap my right arrow and my down arrow to select everything on this import sheet except column A. And then I'm going to do control C just to copy it. And now I'm ready to switch back over to my project plan. And I'm going to click in the first blank task name cell. And by the way, notice the row numbers on the left, those correspond to the task numbers right now. So task one is define project objectives and describe mission statement. And now I'm going to press control V to paste the rest of the information in. So didn't have to type all of that stuff. And some of the rows are kind of weird. I'm seeing some kind of row deviations here in terms of the size. So I'm going to just expand my task name column so we don't get any text wrap. And I'm just dragging it, putting my mouse between the divider between it and the duration column headings. And that just fixed my little row issue that I had. You may not have had that issue. It could be a resolution thing. So we have our task list completed in here now. And that's as of right now. Now, again, we may not know all the information. And since we're in manually scheduled mode, we can use placeholder text, as I mentioned, for duration, start, or finish date. So if you look at task eight by row number, for that duration, which is currently 1.5 days, I'm going to just go into the duration field and I'm going to type ask coordinator and press enter. So it allows me to put placeholder text there. Notice that the corresponding bar on the Gantt chart portion disappeared because we no longer have a duration. Now, once we put it into auto schedule mode, once project takes over the schedule, you won't be able to type that kind of placeholder text in the duration or start and finish date fields. We're going to change that duration back to 1.5 days. So that's only again, because you're in manually scheduled mode, will it allow that? Let's say that our task list is as complete as we think it could be at this point. And so we want project to take over our scheduling. We want to change it all to auto scheduled. And so what I'm going to do, and this is very similar to an Excel, I can click in the gray box between the row and column headings, the intersection box at, for your table on the left to select everything. And then on the task tab of the ribbon in the task group, you will see a manually scheduled icon, which is already shaded because everything is manually scheduled. And right next to it, you have auto schedule. 
go ahead and click auto schedule. And then you can just click away from and on any cell in your table to get rid of the selection. So a couple of things happened. Um, first, take a look at your task mode column. It now has a different icon in there and that icon represents an auto schedule task and it matches the icon that's on the task tab of the ribbon for auto schedule. The other thing that happened is the color of the bars in your Gantt chart changed. They're a deeper color now. Um, before it was a lighter color and that's lighter for a manually scheduled task versus darker for auto scheduled tasks. And last but certainly not least, based on our project start date, it has populated the start and the finish dates for our entire project. Now you'll notice if you look at the start date column, all of the tasks are starting on the project start date. And that's where creating a work breakdown structure to start organizing our tasks and relating them to each other will make our start and finish dates adjust. And that's the section we're going to be going into now. One way to organize our tasks is to start creating summary tasks before applying a work breakdown structure series of codes to each task. So we had earlier seen task zero on my screen and I got rid of it before we really started doing anything when we had our blank template. And so now it's time to bring back task zero. So on the ribbon, I'm going to go to the Gantt chart format tab and over in the show hide group to the right, you're going to check the box in front of project summary task. And when you do that, you get a new task at the very top. It takes on the name of your project. It is in bold. If you look at the row number, it's row zero. That's why it's known as task zero. And that is an example of a summary task. That is your whole project based on the information in here right now. The whole project will take 10 days based on the start and finish dates. So a summary task like this one is its information comes from its subtasks, all the tasks underneath it. So task zero, the project summary task is a good example of a summary task. If I wanted to collapse it, notice right in front of the task name, you have that collapse arrow. If I click that, everything in the project is collapsed. And then I have the expand arrow so I can expand it again. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and entered two other summary tasks for stage one underneath stage one and they're showing on my screen. So you want to get those entered, seek input from training vendor and perform end user skill assessment using indent and outdent as necessary. And then when you're done getting those in, you can pause the video so you can just stare at my screen and get those done. When you're done, you can unpause and I will have the stage two summary task set up on the screen for you to complete on your end. Now you're seeing the stage two project commencement summary tasks and its other summary tasks. So you can pause again and get those set up for stage two. And when you unpause, I'll have stage three and four ready for you. And now here's how you're going to set up stage three and stage four. Stage three is a summary task. It only has one subtask. Stage four includes two summary tasks with subtasks. And now I've collapsed all my stages. And your row numbers should match up to mine. 
So I have tasks 0, 1, 22, 46, and 48 showing on my screen. And so when you were working on your summary and subtasks, to make it more automated, you could have gone down to your status bar where it said new tasks manually scheduled and just change that down there to new tasks auto scheduled so you wouldn't have to change it in the task mode column. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some milestone tasks to our project plan. A milestone task is a task with zero days duration. It's meant to just note a particular milestone in your project plan. So let's expand stage two Stages one and two, if they're not already expanded. And so my stage two is on row 22. I'm going to just right click on that row heading and insert task. And the new task, I'm going to name it stage one project planning complete. And I'm going to give it a zero day duration. So milestone tasks show up on your Gantt chart as that little diamond icon, right? And with the date next to it. So that's how it shows up on your Gantt chart. Zero day task is a milestone task. Now for that task, we want to outdent it so it's at the same level as stage one. So I'm going to just outdent as far as it can be outdented. And then I'm gonna collapse stage one and you see it and its milestone task of zero days. We're gonna expand stage three and right click on its row header and insert task. And this one's gonna be another milestone. It's going to be stage two dash project commencement complete with zero days and outdent it appropriately. And then we're going to have row 50 where stage four is and insert a task and get your Stage three, project implementation and control complete, milestone in. And I'm gonna go ahead and do my outdenting on that one. And then for stage four, I'm gonna expand it. And right before the last task, which is the party, we're going to put in the milestone for stage four being completed. So just noting significant events in your project's lifeline. We have our milestone tasks, we have our subtasks, our summary tasks, and our project is pretty well defined at this point with the exception of one of the most critical components, and that's task relationships. And we're gonna be reviewing them now and then coming back and setting them up. To finish defining our project, we need to learn about task relationships and a little bit of terminology. So there are only four types of relationships in Microsoft Project. There's finish to start, also, you'll see it represented as FS. And that means when one task finishes, another task starts. That is the default relationship type. So if you create a relationship between tasks and you don't do anything else, it will be a finish to start relationship. We have start to start. When one task starts, another task starts. And that's one that you might review once you start tracking what's going on in your project and you feel like you may not be able to make your end date, your projected end date, you can crash the schedule is what it's called 
by reviewing some of your tasks and figuring out ones that can start at the same time and that can gain you more time back in your schedule. You also have finish to finish. When one task finishes, another task finishes, so you need them to finish at the same date. And finally, you have start to finish. This one is infrequently used. When one task starts, another task finishes. So you want a task to start and another task to finish at the same time. And then there's some definitions you need to know about. Your predecessor task is the task that precedes another task. The successor task is the task that follows another task. So let's just use, for example, task one precedes task two. Task one is the predecessor task, and task two would be your successor task. In addition to your relationships, you need to know about lead time and lag time. So let's say you're using the finish to start relationship. When one task finishes, another task starts. Well, maybe when the first task is 50% finished, the next task can start. That would be known as lead time. It allows for task overlap outside of the relationship that's defined. And then you have lag time, which is a task delay. So let's say you have a task that's like, um, we won't have one in this project, but let's say you're painting a room. And that's a task. And let's say it takes three days. Well, you need another day for the paint to dry before the next task, which we'll say is like hanging the paintings, would start. You don't want to make it from a three-day painting task to a four-day painting task because then you'll get resource costs for that extra day. So you build in lag time That says it's a three-day task. After it's finished, wait one day before the next task will start. And now that I'm back in my project plan, we're ready to set up relationships. I've expanded all of my stages, so my full task list is visible to me. And so what we're going to do is we're going to select task two, and I'm just clicking the row header, holding down my control key. Oh, I did that wrong. Okay. So row header two, control key, row header five to select those two tasks. We want to set up a relationship, a finish to start relationship that when task two is finished, task five will start. So we have them selected. And we're going to be working on the task tab of the ribbon. And we're going to be using an icon in the schedule group here. And if you hover over that icon, it looks like the infinity symbol. If you hover over that icon, it says link the selected task. Go ahead and click it. So a couple of things happened. First of all, look at your predecessor's column. So for task five, it's saying that it's predecessor task, the task that has to happen before it can start is task two. And also, if you look at your Gantt chart, remember I said the default relationship type is finish to start. So when task two finishes, task five will start. And you can see that type of relationship on your Gantt chart, if you look at the line with the arrow coming out of the end of task two and the arrows pointing to the beginning of task five, when task two finishes, task five will start. So you just successfully set up a relationship. Now we have more to set up. Now we're going to set up additional relationships. So this time, let's select task three and using the control key, task six, and link those tasks together. Now select task six, seven, and eight. I'm going to just click and drag row headers six, seven, and eight. 
and then link those tasks together. Notice it gives task seven, the predecessor of six, and task eight, the predecessor of seven. Link tasks five and nine to each other. And then link tasks five and 10 to each other. So predecessor for nine and 10 will be task five. Now link 10 and 12 together. Make 12 the predecessor for 13. And then we're at task 14. In order for task 14 to begin, we need tasks 12 and 13 to be finished. So I'm going to start by selecting 12 and 14 and linking those. And then I can actually click in that predecessors box after 12, type a comma and a space and type 13 and then press enter. So that one has two predecessors. Link tasks 13 and 15 to each other. And for task 17, we'll do this a different way. Just go to the predecessor cell for task 17 and do the drop down, and you'll see a list of all of your tasks. You're going to want to scroll up and check the box in front of task 8 and then just click away from there. Or you could have just typed in eight. So some say it's easier to do it that way than select it is certainly more efficient. So we have eight as a predecessor for 17. I'm gonna go to the predecessor box for task 18 and just type 17 and press enter. And for task 19, I'm gonna press 18 and press enter. Task 20, we're going to do 19. And then we're at task 21. That's also going to be 19 as its predecessor. And at this point, I'm just typing them in. You'll know, just like any other Microsoft product, there's multiple ways of doing the same thing. So we have our predecessors in through task 21 at this point. The predecessor for 22, which is one of our milestone tasks, is task 21. So we'll go ahead and get that in. So we have our stage one relationships set up. Now we'll address our stage two relationships so I'm gonna collapse stage one, and I have my stage two ready. We'll be starting and we'll be working in the predecessors column. We'll just type all of these in. We're gonna start with task 25, and I'm in that predecessor column. And I'm gonna just type 20 and press enter. So now you're on task 26, and that's gonna be 25 for your predecessor. 27 and 28 are also going to be 25 as predecessor. And then 29's predecessor is going to be task 26. 30's predecessor is task 25. And then we're going to go down to 32, and its predecessor is also 25. 33's predecessor is 32, 34's predecessor is 33, and 35's predecessor is 34. And then we go to task 37, its predecessor is 33, 38's is 37, 39 is also 37, and 40 is also 37. 
and then you can go down to 42. So we're skipping our summary tasks here, although it is possible to link them to each other as well. Both 42 and 43 have 26 as a predecessor. And then we're at 45, and 45 has a predecessor, 45 and 46 rather, both have a predecessor of 26. And then we get to our milestone task for the completion of stage two. And for this one, we're actually going to use a summary task. So we're going to put in 36 as the predecessor for 47. Task 49, conduct training and track attendees, or it should be attendance. I have a typo there. I'll fix it. That one is going to be 47 as its predecessor. So 49 has 47 as a predecessor. So now I'm going to make sure in my task 49, and I believe we bought that in from Excel. So I just double clicked it and I'm going to just fix the typo on attendance. And then I notice my stage three milestone task doesn't say complete at the end. So I'm going to just add that word there. And then we're into stage four with task 53. And actually, I forgot the stage three one, but that's okay. We'll just, for task 50, let's go ahead and make that predecessor 49. And then we'll go down to 53. And 53, we're going to give it a predecessor of 50. Task 54 has 53 as its predecessor. Task 55 has two predecessors. And that would be 53 comma 54. And task 56 has three predecessors. And that would be 53, 54, and 55. So I'm just typing those in separated by commas. Almost done here. So task 58 has 52 as its predecessor. Another summary task there. 59 has 58 as its predecessor. And 60 has 59 as its predecessor. And finally, the last task, task 62, we're going to be using task 50 as its predecessor. And go ahead and save your project plan. Now, because we set up our relationships, let's talk about the things that have changed in our project plan. Notice your start and finish dates have adjusted according to the relationship. Also, if you look at task zero, you'll see now the duration of our project is 63.5 days. And that's all the stages rolled up to that duration. So our schedule is, our tasks have been scheduled at this point because of the relationships. Now I'm going to expand all my stages again, and we're going to add the work breakdown structure codes. Work breakdown structure codes are universally known. Great way to talk about particular tasks in meetings and stuff like that. And often your tasks are referred to by their code numbers, their WBS codes, rather than the task name. So I'm going to show you two ways of where you can display your WBS codes. So the first way I'm going to show you is this. If you right click on your task name column heading and choose insert column, 
start typing WBS and you'll see it shows up on the list. And once it's highlighted on the list, you can just press enter. So now we have another column in this table with the WBS codes in them. That's one way of getting your codes to display. Let's right click on the WBS column heading and in project hide column means delete column. I mean, you could get it back by inserting it again, but notice the symbol next to hide column has the little X, the red deletion X on it. So we're going to delete that column and I'll show you another way of displaying your WBS codes without inserting another column. This is my preferred way. We're going to go to the ribbon, to the Gantt chart format tab on the ribbon and all the way to the right in the show hide group where we got our project summary task checkbox earlier for task zero, you'll see another box in there called outline number. Go ahead and check it. And now if you look in your task name column, each task has its WBS code before the task name. So the first task, task one, is our stage one project planning task, our summary task. Its subtasks are 1.1 and 1.2. And then the next summary task that we have in there is 1.3. Its subtasks are 1.3.1, 1.3.2, so on and so forth. So a nice way of being able to refer to your task are by using the WBS codes. Now, later on, you'll see if we edit tasks, if we add more tasks, the WBS codes will automatically update if we delete tasks, so on and so forth. Once they're there, they're there, and you can make any modifications necessary. So now we're gonna build in some lead and or lag time for some of our tasks. Let's start with task seven. So I'm still using the row numbers. We don't have to refer to them by the WBS codes. I'm still using our row numbers. So we made task six its predecessor. And we want to have some lag time there. So these are all finished to start relationships. What we would like to happen is when task six is finished, wait four days before starting task seven. So we want to give it some lag time. What you're going to do is just double click on task seven. And when you double click a task, the task information dialog box opens. You have several tabs across the top, general predecessors, resources, so on and so forth. You're going to go to the predecessor tab and notice all the way to the right, there's a column called lag. There is no lead column in Microsoft Project. When you want to do lag time, you represent it as negative. It could be days, it could be percentages. And that's how the system knows it's lag if it starts off with a negative. If it's lead time, you're gonna put it in the lag column. It could be represented as percentages or days as well. And you use that a positive number for that. So we want four days of lag here before this task starts. So in that lag column, we're gonna type minus four, and I'm gonna type the D for days and press enter. And now click okay. So notice now in the predecessors column, it says for task seven, six, FS, which is finished to start, minus four days. So it's showing the lag there, right? So if you look at it on the Gantt chart, right, the line is coming out of the end of task six and it's lagging before it goes into minus four days, minus four days of lag time before it starts the next task is what we're telling it to do there, right? So lag time is represented as a negative, lead time is represented as a positive. Now go to task 20 and give it two days of lag time. 
And when you're done, its predecessor should say 19 FS minus two days. Let's double click on task 26 to get into its task information box. And for this one, we want to give it a half day of lead time. So in the lag box, I'm going to just type 0.5 and enter and click OK. So now you'll see its predecessor says 25 FS for finish to start plus this one is going to start a half a day before task 25 is complete. It's overlap. So if you have problems finding the Gantt bar for a particular task, like it, right now on my screen, I'm not seeing the Gantt bar for task 26. I'm going to right click on the task name and I'm going to choose scroll to task and it brings that bar into view. Give task 33 two days of lag time. And your predecessor's column for that task should look like mine. Change the type of relationship to start to start for task 37 as well. And do the same for task 39. Make it in a start to start relationship. Add two days of lead time to task 40. You're also going to add two days of lead time to task 45, three days of lead time to task 46. And you can see the results of those on my screen. We're going to add one day of lead time to task 47 and two days to task 49. Let's go ahead and give task 53 two days of lead time. And for task 58, we're going to do 90, 90 days of lead time. And you can see the results on my screen. And then the next task, task 59, we're going to give it one day of lag. So that's going to be your minus one there. So now if I look at task zero, we're up to 146 and a half days duration. We added that 90 day lead. So that means wait 90 days after that task before the next one or its successor task will start. And so our start and finish dates have updated. Our project is thoroughly scheduled and designed right now, except for some more tasks so I noticed that I had accidentally deleted some of my stage three tasks. I rebuilt that part of the project plan and put in the correct duration and predecessors. So I just want to make sure your stage three is exactly like mine as highlighted on the screen. And then in stage three, what we're going to do is we're going to change the duration of task 49 to 10 days. So we want that to be a 10 day task. Now your stage three's duration should have updated when you change that to 10 days, but I want you to scroll to the very top and I want you to look at task zero, the project summary task that has been off. That is only showing the duration. I'm going to collapse my stages now just so we can see clearly what's going on here. So our project summary task is only showing the duration of stage four, and it should be showing the duration of all of the stages cumulative. So one way that you can jog project into doing its job when it comes to this, if your project summary task, task zero doesn't update, you can link your stages to each other to get it to update. So what we're going to do is we're going to just click and drag row headings one, through 55. So basically selecting our stages and on the task tab of the ribbon, you're going to go ahead and link those tasks together. 
And now you'll notice that your stage four actually adjusted. It really is 108 days. And that's where we put that 90 day lead time. So it is 108 days, but cumulatively our project is 153 days if you add up the stage durations. So you need to kind of know about that little shortcut. Sometimes it won't update, sometimes it will. And this has happened in various versions of project. We've decided that when we get to stage three, which I'm going to expand, we want to have conference calls for one hour every day during that stage. So we just want the whole team to get together, talk about how things are going. Are there any risk assessments? So we want to add those recurring calls to our project plan file. And the way to do that, so, so far when we've been inserting new tasks, we've been right clicking on a row heading and choosing insert tasks. To get the recurrent schedule, you can't use that method for a recurring task. So I'm gonna just select row header 49, just so that task is selected. And on the task tab of the ribbon, in the insert group, I'm gonna do the drop down arrow underneath task. So when I do the drop down, I can see where I can create a recurring task. So I'm gonna select recurring task there. And we're gonna name the task status call. And notice it defaults to a one day duration. Be careful of that. Go to your duration box to the right and change the D to an H, which represents one hour. And we're gonna do this call. So we're gonna do the call daily. So we're gonna do that option button. And we're gonna say every one work day. And then we're gonna start it. So we say stage three, the actual work begins on stage three on, it looks like Wednesday 8:10 with the training starting. So we're gonna start the calls. We'll just change it to August 10th as our start date. So we just wanna start them with that phase when that phase is up and running. And we'll say end after, so we have 12 days in that. We'll end it after 10 occurrences. So we wanna have 10 of these status calls during stage three. And go ahead and click okay. So now right underneath stage three, you have your 10 incidents of the status calls, each one for one hour, right? Every weekday starting on August 10th is what we set up. So you want to have them as close to the top of the summary task as possible. So they're not just blending in with your other stage three tasks. And we wanna change the name of that status call summary task. Um, before we do that, look at your indicators column. So you have a recurring call and it has the recurrence circular arrows in the indicator column. And then for each occurrence of the call, it has a little calendar icon. And if you hover over a calendar icon, it says this task has a start no earlier constraint, start no earlier than constraint on Wednesday, August 10th. So for each one, it'll give the same constraint. The call is on every day starting on the 10th. So just more icons you'll see in your indicators column. We're gonna double click on 3.1 status call and we're gonna change the name of it to daily conference call. Daily, we'll just say daily call and then in parentheses to address issues and close your parentheses and then click okay. So it's gonna rename every instance of that call that way. And that's fine by us. So we added those. Also notice that your work breakdown structure codes just adjust if you add or delete, like I mentioned earlier. And we can go ahead and collapse stage three. 
And the last thing we're going to do in module one is I'm going to show you a way to capture additional information about tasks. We'll only address three tasks in this section out of our extensive list of tasks. And we're going to start by adding a note to task one. I'm going to just expand stage one. I don't have to expand it to do this. And then I'm going to double click on it to get into the task information dialog box. And in there you have a notes tab at the top. Now I suggest that you date and in initial notes and if multiple people are going to be working in this plan file, that the newest note should be at the top of the note list. So I'm going to just go in and put in the date and I'm going to put in my initials and then I'm going to press enter and the note is going to be assumptions colon. You could take it off of my screen. And the first assumption is software will be rolled out to the participants workstations during training. The next line is going to be HR and training management has given their approval and allocated the funds and budget for this project. And our last assumption for this task is all necessary compliance and regulatory issues have been addressed. And then you're going to click OK. And so if you look at your indicators column, you'll have that sticky note icon. And in order to see the note, you can just hover over that icon and you'll see most of the note, but it cuts off. So you would have to double click to get to the notes tab to see the rest of it. So they're indicated by the sticky note in the indicators column. We're going to put on two more notes. Let's go to task 11. So that's another summary task. I'm going to just double click it and I'm going to date the note and initial it. And then this one is going to just be, can be skipped if instructors and training are done in house and then click OK. And we have one more note that we're going to add here, and that's going to be for stage three, so task 48. And let me just show you another way of getting to the task information dialog box. This time I'm going to right click on stage three or line 48, and I'm going to click on information. And that's just another way other than double clicking. You could also get to it from the task tab of the ribbon in the properties group. There's an information box. So in here, I want to go to notes and I'm going to date and initial it. And this one is also going to start with assumption and in a colon, the rollout will take place over two weeks and then in parentheses, 10 business days to train 75-80 users. And the next sentence, each session can have up to eight users for optimal learning. And then I'm going to just put another sentence. This is the start of the hands on training and click OK. So great way to capture additional information. I've seen project plans where the name, the task name is not just the name of the task, but all these notes about the task. 
So you have to have some place to put this additional information. Notes would be it. Task name would not be. To recap what we've covered in module one, we started by going over project management concepts, specifically the phases of project management. We started our work in Microsoft Project in the definition and planning stage of project management. And then you got a grand tour of the project environment and how to navigate within it. And then we created a project plan from a blank template. We defined the project by setting, by deciding to schedule it from its start date and setting the start date. And then we created a project calendar based off of the built-in standard calendar. We listed a couple of holidays as exceptions on the calendar. And then we assigned that calendar to our project plan. In lesson three, we started adding tasks to the project plan. We manually entered some tasks and then we imported tasks from an Excel file that's in the video description. We started creating our work breakdown structure by organizing our task into different groupings. So we grouped our task by stages. We have four t stages in our project plan and we got our summary task and our subtask. And then we learned about the task relationships as well as some definitions like successor tasks and predecessor tasks. And you learned about lag and lead time and then we created the relationships between tasks by linking them. We then went and changed some of the relationship types and we added lag and or lead time to some of our tasks. And by doing that, we were able to schedule our task. We had already switched to automatic scheduling. So then the start dates and the finish dates are based on the nature of the relationships and any lag or lead time. After that, we got our work breakdown structure codes to show in the task name column so that the task can be referenced by their WBS code as opposed to their name. We've been referencing them by row number in this course. We moved on and set up a recurring task for a series of 10 daily calls that will take place when the training starts in our project plan. And you learned how to create that recurring task and set up its recurrent schedule. And then finally, we added some notes to some tasks to capture some additional information. Now that we have our project plan file as complete as it can be right now, in terms of our task list, we're gonna move into module two. Module two has two lessons, lesson four and lesson five. In lesson four, we'll be managing project plan resources by adding resources to a project plan. We'll also be creating a resource calendar, entering cost for resources, assigning resources to task, and resolving resource conflicts. In lesson five, we'll be finalizing our project plan. And this is typically the last step before you start running your plan. So work starts on the project. You wanna optimize your project plan. There's a couple of steps for that. You're gonna set a baseline and learn what that is and also learn how to share your project plan before work begins on the project. Before we begin adding resources to our plan file, it's important to understand the three different types of resources that are utilized in Microsoft Project. You have work resources, which is the default resource type, and that type of resource is associated with and tracked by time. It also allows for costs to be tracked. It can be people, and they can be listed as individual or consolidated groups, or a work resource could also be equipment that is necessary to be used on the project. Then you have material resources. 
They're assigned by quantity rather than time. Gravel, paper, concrete, and paint are examples of material resources. When you enter a, a material resource, you have to enter its measurement. So for example, if you entered paper as a material resource, its measurement would be reams. And then you have a cost resource type. These are based on cost without time or quantity consideration. These can include travel costs, costs for building permits, or end of project celebration costs. And their total, the amount that they are, like let's say you had a lot of travel on your project. Each travel cost would be noted at that task level. So if someone has a task to teach a class and it's in a different city, they have to travel to get to that city, their travel costs would be noted on that task. So you'll learn how to deal with all three resource types in just a few moments. To add resources to your project plan file, you're going to want to use resource sheet view. So on the left side of your screen to the left of your entry table where it says Gantt chart, remember that's your view indicator, we're gonna right click there and we're gonna choose resource sheet. So it looks like an Excel spreadsheet. A couple of things I will point out is when you're in this view, if you look up at your ribbon, the last tab is resource sheet format because you're in resource sheet view. So just wanna point out how tabs change depending on views changing. So we have an information column here. I'll go over the columns before we start entering our resources. Your resource name column. If it's a work resource, it could be the actual name of the person if you know it. If you don't know the person's name when you're putting your plan file together, you could give like a title like trainer one or something like that. If you're gonna have a group of people that can perform the same task, like if you're gonna have five trainers, you can list them individually by their names or trainer one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth. Or you could do one line item. And I'm gonna jump over from resource name to the max units column here. It just says max, but it's max units. If I had five trainers and I wanted one line item, I would make their max units 500%. So if there are five trainers available to work on my project 100% of their time, their max units would be 500%. So for work resources, you can enter them quite a few ways. And right now, we're going to use a combination of those ways. Your type column is a drop down for work material or cost. It will default to work. Your material column, as mentioned, if you're using a material resource, for example, paper, you have to put in its measurement, which would be reams. The initials will populate with the first letter of your resource name. Group is a column that you can use for whatever you want. If you need to track internal resources versus external resources, you can use the column for that, for example. And it's a column that can show on reports. Your maximum units is how much time in percentage your resource is available to your project. And then you have your cost column. So you have their standard rate, if you have rate information, you can put it in hourly, weekly, monthly, annually, daily, and you can specify an overtime rate if necessary. Project no will never switch from the standard rate to the overtime rate. It's something you would have to tell project to do. Overtime is calculated differently in different states. And then you have costs per use. So let's say you're renting a training room, for example, how much does it cost each time you use that training room? You have an accrual column. Your costs are normally prorated across the task, right? Or you can have them accrue at the start or the end of the task. 
And then the base calendar is the same calendar as your project calendar. You also have another free field code, which is like group. You can use it for anything that you may need to use it for. In the first resource name cell, we're going to type Emily with the last name Barrington. And we're going to leave it on the default type of work resource. So we can skip, I'm using my tab key, the material column. Notice that the first letter of the resource name populates automatically in the initials column. For the group, I'm going to type internal. And she is our training director. I'm going to say that she's available to our project 50% of the time of her time. Now it just so happens that we have her rate information. So part of her salary will be charged to this project for the time that she spends on this project at her normal rate. So we're going to just put in her normal rate. Now, sometimes you won't have cost information for resources. Sometimes you will, if tracking cost is your responsibility, then you should, uh, or at least get estimated costs if necessary. So we're going to say, we're going to type in 75,000 slash Y for year. And we're not going to give her an overtime rate or a cost per use. We're not going to change anything else. And I'm just double clicking between standard rate and overtime column so I can see her salary. And so her 50% availability means project won't schedule her more than 50% of her time on our project. All right. So now we have our next person and this person is Teresa Brown. She's also a work resource and she's also in the internal group. She's our training manager. When our project is up and running, she'll be available 100% of the time. So we can leave her at 100% max units. And her salary is 50,000 slash Y. We have our next one. Now we're not certain. The training department has several training coordinators and we're going to need two of them to help on our project. So what we're going to do is we know that we'll be given their actual names before work starts. So we're going to just list them as training coordinator one, make them internal a hundred percent of their time. And we know that the coordinators rate is 35,000 slash Y for a year. And then we're going to put in a training coordinator two with the same group and standard rate. And we can always come in and fill in their real names when we get them. And anywhere, if we've already assigned them to task, the task will update with their real names. And then we have, so we have our training coordinators, our training director, training manager, our coordinators. Now we're going to put in our HR director and his name is Randy Allison, another work resource who's also internal. He's available like 25% of his time for our project. And he's at 75,000 a year as well. Our HR manager's name is Alan and the last name is Otto. Another work resource that's internal and he's available 50% of his time. His salary is 50,000 per year. And we have just a few more. So we're going to have, let's see where I am here. We'll just do all of our work ones first. We know we're probably going to be using two trainers from a vendor. So we don't know their names yet. We'll put them in as vendor trainer 
one and their group is external, they'll be available 100% of their time once that part of the project starts. And the rate for the vendor is 1500 a day. So I'm doing 1500 slash D. And then we're going to do the same for vendor trainer two. And now we're ready to do a material resource. So we're going to have posters that are displayed advertising these classes. And we're going to use, we'll put in the resource name as posters. And when you tab over the type, if you type the letter M, it will populate material. And we'll say it's measured in sheets. And notice the standard rate is just a flat rate there. So we're going to just put in 10 for $10. And then we have a cost resource and we're going to name it entertainment and change the type to cost. And we don't need to note anything else here for a cost resource. Again, that's assigned at the task level. So we have our resource sheet completed. So another thing just to note here, and we'll deal with it in a later module is sometimes you'll inherit a project plan file and it doesn't have any task list or Gantt chart or anything. It only has a resource sheet in it. And that can be used across projects. It's called a resource pool. And we'll revisit that later on in this course. Go ahead and save your project plan. So we get our resource sheet filled out and we look at it and realize we forgot to put our marketing manager, Alice, on here. So we want her to be included with our internal work resources. We're going to right click on row heading seven here in resource sheet view and go to insert resource just to get that blank line, just like when we were in the entry table in Gantt chart view. So in that blank line, we're going to get her name in there. And so her name is Alice Peak. She is a work resource. We're going to put her in the internal group. She'll be available 100% of her time. And she is a manager, so we're putting her salary at 50000 per year, like our other managers. Now, the thing about Alice that we need to know, all of our other resources will be available to us for the duration of the project, except Alice. She already has some time off, and so we need to note that. And the way that we note it is by creating a resource calendar for Alice. So to do that, we're going to just double click on Alice and it opens up the resource information dialog box. Just like when you double click on a task, it opens up task information. And on the right side, we're going to click that change working time button. And so this is, if you look at the top, this is very similar to when we created our training rollout initiative calendar. If you look at the top, it says our, that is our base calendar, but now we're at the resource calendar for Alice. So if your resources have time off, it needs to be noted, but not on the project calendar. So by going into change working time for Alice, we're creating her resource calendar. And we're going to navigate to July 22nd on that mini calendar. And we're going to select July 22nd in the exception box, the first name box under the exceptions tab. We're going to type personal day and press our tab key. And we're going to click on July 25th on the mini calendar and put another personal day entry for that date there for Alice. And then we're gonna click okay and okay. Now July 25th and July 22nd are working days for everybody else on the project, but Alice won't be scheduled for any work on those days. And we can 
right click on our resource sheet view indicator on the left and go back to Gantt chart view and just save your project again. There are quite a few ways that you can assign resources to tasks. We're going to start by using the resource name column on our entry table in Gantt chart view. So it's the last column before you get to add column, right? Add new column. And so for task two, we're going to do the drop down in the resource names column, and you'll see all your resources. Regardless of how you enter them in on the resource sheet, they will be alphabetical on this drop down list. And we're going to check Emily Barrington and then just click away from it. So now if you right click on task two and you go to scroll to task, if you look at the Gantt bar, it shows Emily Barrington and it's also showing that she's only available 50% of her time. For task three, we're going to assign Teresa Brown. And go ahead and assign Teresa Brown to tasks five, six, and seven. So a couple of things happened when you did that. You got three little red people in your indicators column. And that means that Teresa Brown is now over allocated. And we will take care of that a little bit later in this lesson. But the other thing I want to show you is how I did that task, how I assigned her to tasks five, six, and seven. I didn't do them individually in the resource name column. What I did was I just clicked and drag row headers five through seven, right click within the row headers that are selected, and I went to information. So notice there's no task name there because I have multiple tasks selected, but then I went to the resources tab and I just did the drop down there. So that's how I got them in there, Teresa Connor Brown, three times. Just a little bit more efficient way. It caused an over allocation. And again, we will address resolving over allocations later in this lesson. For right now, I'm going to fill in the rest of the resource name assignments for stage one. And then you'll be able to pause and put them in on your screen. So now you have on my screen, I got rid of some of my columns in my table. So you're just seeing the task name and resource names. You can go ahead and finish filling out the resource assignments for stage one and pause the video while you're doing that. So you can see my screen clearly. And then when you resume the video, I'll have stage two up on the screen. You'll pause and get those in resume, stage three, so on and so forth. So you're going to be doing these assignments on your own. And I showed you how, like you have a lot where training coordinator is assigned. You can select all four of those tasks at the same time and either right click to get to information or click information up here on the task tab of the ribbon. So you don't have to do them as individuals. So go ahead and get started on this. And here are your stage two resource assignments. Again, pause. Here's stage three. And finally, here's stage four. Now that we have all of our work resources assigned, we are going to go ahead and assign our material resource. And we're going to do this one a different way. So go ahead and select task 33 and go to the resource tab on your ribbon. And in the assignments group, you're going to click on assigned resources. So notice that we have Alice Peak assigned to that resource, right? Create posters and place them in high traffic areas. And it calculated her cost for that particular task. 
but we also want to, I'm going to scroll down here and we're going to click on the posters resource and choose the assign button on the right. So we have the posters assigned there. And for the units, we have one sheet because we put in the material measurement as a sheet. And we're going to change that to 500 sheets. Trying to get into that field can be a little challenging. I had to type 500 in there. Yeah. So it calculates the cost for me. And so we have multiple resources assigned to that now. We have Alice as the work resource, and then we have the posters, and we put the number of units based on the material measurement and its cost. And so we can close that assign resources box. And we're gonna do a similar thing. Let's go to the bottom of the project plan, our last task, task 77. Go ahead and select that one and go up to assign resources on the resource tab. And for this one, we're going to assign entertainment. So that's our cost resource, right? And we're going to go ahead and put in a cost of 10,000 and then do assign. So we have $10,000 budgeted for this huge party at the end of everything. And we're going to go ahead and do the X. And so if you notice the resource name for task 77 says entertainment and it has the 10,000 for that one. And if we go up to task 33, you'll see the resource name has Alice peak and then the posters 500 sheets. And if I, I'm going to move my divider bar backwards and I'm going to right click on create posters and scroll to task. So it shows on the Gantt chart as well when you have a material or a cost resource. So at this point, before we resolve our resource conflicts, we're making believe here that we just got the information of which two training coordinators will be working on our project. So let's go to our resource sheet view and we'll update that information. So here's another view where you can see where you have over allocated resources. They're in red. They have the little red people in the indicator column. For training coordinator one, we're just going to change the name. And that name is Eugenia Washington. And for training coordinator two, it's Anita Redman. And we're going to save and then go back to our Gantt chart view. And you'll notice that anywhere that we assigned training coordinator one. So if I look at the beginning, I have my stage one collapsed there, right? But they weren't in that stage. But anywhere where we had um, training coordinator one, it now is Eugenia Washington. And so in addition to receiving the training coordinator names, we've also received the information on how they're going to divvy up their responsibilities on the project. So they're doing it by stage and, and summary tasks. So Eugenia is assigned to stage one, identify departments. That's where their assignments start. And so she's going to tackle that. What we're going to do for tasks 12, 13, and 14, I'm going to select those as a group, go up to the task tab and go to information and the properties. And I'm going to go to the resources tab and change the assignment to Anita Redman and then click OK. So it put in, it has Eugenia and Anita there. I'm going to go to the resource name column and just access the drop down. I made that column super wide. So let me fix that a little bit. And I want to get rid of Eugenia. So just uncheck her. 
click away from it. And you get that little warning symbol when you click away, click on that. And we're going to decrease the amount of work, but keep the same duration. That's the option we want. And we'll talk about that setting later, but we want to go with the default. And go ahead and remove Eugenia from the next two tasks as well. And keep that same default. And so this is how they've determined they're going to work together. So we have Eugenia in identifying departments and so on and so forth. Anita will seek input from the training vendor. Eugenia will perform the end user skill assessment. And we'll switch, and I'm going to just do this from the drop down in stage two. Um, task starting with task 25 i'm going to switch eugenia to anita in that summary task list and then that way we don't get that confirmation if i select you anita and then uncheck eugenia it just does it in that section Okay, so the next section, well, we're going to, oh, there's another one in that section that we need to assign to, yeah, task 30 also needs to be assigned to Anita. Our next one, marketing strategy, um, the one email is going to be Eugenia, and we'll leave her in the training sessions registration. And then in schedule instructors and courseware evaluations, so tasks 42, 43, 45, and 46, switch those to Anita instead of Eugenia. And then I think we should be done with the training coordinators. I'll double check that in a moment. But after we do those, because it already updated in the, um, the daily calls that we have. So we don't have to, we had, a, we had assigned both training coordinators to those calls. So we don't have to do anything with that section. And the next section underneath the calls, we do have Eugenia, that's fine. And then they're working together. And we're good for the rest of this. All right. And just some of our over allocations for Eugenia have disappeared. So in order to resolve resource conflicts, like over allocations, you can let project do it for you, or you can do it manually. I'm going to show you where you would have to do it manually and you'll be able to make your choice as to what's the best way for you. So I'm going to right click on Gantt chart on our view indicator on the left, and I'm going to go to resource usage view. And in resource usage view, you have a time phased scale on the right side of your screen. And on the left side, you have any unassigned resources and then your resources that are assigned and the tasks that they're assigned to. Any over allocated resources will show there in red with the little red person in the indicator column. And it gives you the amount of work hours assigned to that resource. If you look at Teresa Brown in that list and you're seeing the work that she's scheduled for on a daily basis, right? You can see her over allocations in red. So, on this particular date, I guess this is in the week of June 19th, so 20th, 21st, 22nd, on the 23rd, so Thursday, she's scheduled for two eight-hour tasks in the same day, and the same for Friday. 
You can see on the following Monday, she scheduled for 20 hours worth of work. So if you were going to try to resolve this over allocation manually, this is what you would need. You would need a paper and a pencil. You would need to go look at the resources calendar before you do anything. And it would go something like this. Now we're not going to do it this way, but I'll explain it to you. So I'm going to look at that first day where she has an over allocation that Thursday. So she has two tasks that are eight hours each. And what I'd have to do is take one of those tasks away from her on that day by making it zero hours. And then I would have to scroll to the right until I find another day that she has an opening. And the first weekday that I see where she may have an opening here, as far as I can see, she's not over allocated, is on the Thursday after the 4th of July, that kind of thing, or the Friday. So I would have to change one of her tasks on that first day to zero hours, and then put that eight hours for that task on another day that she has availability, only if I've looked at the resources schedule, the resources calendar, because they might have time off. So you can see where this can be a tedious, not only tedious, but it lends itself to mistakes. So you can let project do this for you. I'm gonna switch back to Gantt chart view. And we're gonna go to the resource tab of the ribbon. So the last group on the resource tab is the level group. And that's the way that you can let project help you resolve your resource conflicts over allocations um, when it's resolved, it's called leveling the project. So you have a couple of options here. You could level the entire project or you could just level by specific resources. This is what I normally do. So I start by going to resource sheet view. It's just an easier way of seeing which resources are over allocated. So we have four that are over allocated. I'm gonna go back to Gantt chart view. And in that level group on the resource tab, I'm gonna choose level resource. Before we do that, we need to look at task zero. So right now the duration of the project is 155 days. It starts on June 21st and it ends on January 25th in the next year. And you wanna make note of that. Once you make note of that, you're gonna click on level resource. And we'll start since they're in alphabetical order here, it looks like by first name this time. We will start with, let's see, we have Teresa, Eugenia, Anita, and Alice. So we'll start with Alice, and then we're gonna just click the Level Now button. And then we're gonna go back to Level Resource, and we're gonna choose Anita and Level Now. And you see things are adjusting. If you look at project zero, the duration, the start, the finish dates are adjusting, right? And then we're gonna go to level resource again, and we're gonna level Eugenia. And then we'll go back one more time and select Teresa. So, and sometimes that causes other things. So I'm gonna go back to resource sheet view and it's still showing that they're all over allocated. So we have to do some other work on this. We're gonna go back to Gantt chart view and this is pretty typical. Sometimes when you just do level your resources like we did, it fixes everything. Other times it doesn't. So this time, we're going to make note of where we are now with the duration. So it's pushed out our project and its finish date is pushed out as well as its duration has expanded. And so 
this time, I'm going to click the level all button and it gets rid of everything. It also pushed it out by another four days. Okay. So originally it was scheduled to end on January 25th, but after we level everything, it pushed it out about three weeks. And we're going to just say that that three weeks is tolerable for us. Now, there are some other ways that you can gain time back in your project. We talked about using the start to start relationship type. And I forgot to, I'm in my Gantt chart view. I forgot to add back in my predecessors column. Let me get that back in there. And so you can review, let's say that three weeks is intolerable. You need to gain like a week back. You could look at your relationships and figure out, can any of these tasks get started on the same date, right? And if so, you can change them to start relationship that gains you more time in your schedule. So if we look at, let me give you a good example of this. If we look at task six, and that's a seven day task in duration. So task seven is set to start. We put a lag time on that. So it's set to start four days after task six is completed because we put that lag on there. And then we look at this, we have to perform the training needs analysis before we compile the results. So we can't really do anything about those two, right? But then I look for another opportunity, right? Of where I can start, especially if I can use some of the training, you know, we have two training coordinators. So maybe if I can start some of the other tasks on the same day, that would gain us back a week in our schedule. So those are decisions you'll have to make as you're going through your schedule. You're probably always going to end up with some over allocation of resources. If you let project level it for you, it could push out your finish date to an intolerable level. And then you'll have to use the other techniques like we talked about start to start relationship type or some more um, lead time between two tasks. So there's that overlap to gain time back in your schedule. So now we're moving into lesson five, and this is where we're going to spend some time optimizing our plan. We're going to set a baseline. And before that, you'll learn what a baseline is. And then we'll also go over how to share a project plan. And these are the final steps before work begins on the project, hopefully. So we're going to start when we're talking about optimizing a project plan, we've already discussed some of that, and that could be changing the relationship type from finish to start in order to gain some more time back in your schedule. It's also finalizing resource assignments, and it is resolving any over allocations that haven't been resolved through leveling. So if we scroll down in the project, we'll start seeing little red people again. And so we have, and a lot of it is Eugenia Washington, and she's our training coordinator one. So because she's over allocated there, and this is for, let's see, so tasks 34, 37, 38, and 39. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change those over to Anita Redman who is training coordinator too. So I'm gonna change the resource for all of those tasks to Anita from Eugenia. And now I actually have some more over allocations for Anita. So let's change that back. Let's change 34 back to Eugenia. And we'll say that we're, so we're in a situation now, oh, wow, when I changed it back, it got rid of all of my over allocations. That's very strange. But anyway, I changed it and then I changed it back and it's magically cleared all my over allocations. So if you need to go ahead and change yours so they're not over allocated if necessary. 
And that's one thing that you'll do when you're optimizing your plan. That was very strange. I'm going to just save my project now. And yeah, it got rid of all the over allocations. That must be some kind of a glitch because it doesn't typically work that way. And then the other thing that we're going to do here is we want to assign the two vendor trainers to the actual training. So that's going to be down at task 60. We're going to change that assignment. So it's 10 days. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the drop down in the resource name column. We're going to uncheck Eugenia and check vendor trainer one and vendor trainer two. And the setup is they'll probably be alternating the days of training. And when you get that warning, we're going to leave it on the default, keep the same duration. So we have that set up there. And that's really how you optimize your project. You just make sure that your task list is correct in terms of relationships. If there's any way of truncating the project by using start to start relationship type, you would want to do that or by adding lead time to task if necessary, making sure your final resource assignments are done and any over allocations are resolved. And once you do all of that, save your project. So this lesson is all about finalizing your project plan. And so the next step in finalizing your plan for certain is setting a baseline plan. Now you may or may not need an interim plan, but you're definitely going to need to set a baseline plan before work starts on your project. And that is the only way you'll be able to track the progress of your project. So this slide is talking about the baseline plan and you can set up to 11 baseline plans for each project plan file. Well, that begs the question, why would you need more than one? Well, maybe you want a baseline for your external customer and another one for your internal team that has other tasks on it that you don't necessarily need to share with the external customer. Maybe you're preparing for a risk event, so you have an alternate plan in case some things occur and it impacts the project. Or you know that there's a big change request that's going to be implemented on this project. And so you want a baseline of your original plan just for future reference. So those are some of the reasons why you would have multiple baseline, baseline plans. Now your baseline tracks your durations, the start and finish dates of your tasks, the amount of work and the cost. You also have the ability to set an interim plan and that only saves the current start and finish dates. Uh, it can be used just as a project marker. It's much more simple than your baseline. So we're going to go in and we're going to learn how to set a baseline in our project plan. We're going to go to the project tab of the ribbon to set our baseline. And on the project tab, you'll find set baseline in the schedule group. And so if I go to the drop down arrow, I can set or clear the baseline. I'm going to choose set baseline. So it defaults to setting a baseline and it's just called baseline. If you do the drop down arrow next to baseline, you'll see that you can have up to 11 in a project plan file as we discussed. So we're going to leave it on baseline. If you wanted to set an interim plan, you could do that from the same dialog box. We're going to just focus on the baseline. You could set a baseline for the entire project or just for selected tasks. We're going to leave it on entire project and we're going to click OK. Now, it doesn't look like anything happened, 
but I can show you how you can verify that it did set a baseline. There are two different ways. Let's go back to set baseline and you'll see that now baseline tells you when it was last saved. So you know if a baseline has been set because it would be saved and we can cancel out of there. Another way is we're going to go up to our quick access toolbar and go to our project information dialog box. And in the lower left hand corner, you're going to click on statistics. So if your baseline values are populated here, that means that a baseline has been set. And so when I was managing projects actively, I would be in project statistics multiple times a day once work began on the project just to keep apprised. I worked on some really huge projects and so I needed to be apprised at that level. So it captures your start and finish dates. All of these are the same now. The duration of the project, the amount of work on the project, and the total cost of the project. And at the bottom left corner, you can see that it also captures the duration percent complete and the work percent complete. So once work starts on the project and you come into your plan and you start tracking your actuals, these values will fluctuate. You can go ahead and click close on your project statistics dialog box and go ahead and save your project again. Now that we've optimized our plan and set a baseline, there may be at this point occasion to share your plan with some of your stakeholders. And so short of sharing your project plan file, which I'm, when I was managing projects, I was very reluctant to do. Um, because people get in there, they play around. A lot of them don't know what they're doing. And I've had to recreate some plans that way. However, there are other ways. We're going to start with the least efficient way, the way that I'm going to suggest you never use. And let's go to the file tab of the ribbon and click on print. So when you just go to print your plan, it puts a legend at the bottom of the page showing what all the different icons that are found on the Gantt chart mean. And it generated, if I look at the very bottom, it generated 28 pages. Now I'm going to show you why I say this is the least efficient way. I'm going to go in the lower right hand corner to the multiple pages icon. And I can see that there are plenty of blank pages from blank areas of the Gantt chart. So in my opinion, this is not an efficient way to share your plan by printing it out and distributing the printout. I'm going to use the back arrow at the top of the green band to go backwards. So let's say you have stakeholders that want to see just the list of task names and their durations for the entire project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with task zero and I'm going to select the task name cell and the duration cell. Then I'm going to hold down my shift and control keys on my keyboard and tap my down arrow. So it selects the rest of the tasks and their durations. Now on the task tab in the clipboard group, you're going to click on the copy button right on the word copy and not its drop down arrow. We'll address the drop down arrow in a few minutes. So just click on copy. Nothing visible happens. It just copied it to the clipboard. Now I have a blank document open in word and I'm just going to switch to that and I'm going to do control V to paste. So I get two pages and it's just a list of all the tasks and their durations. And I could distribute this as an email attachment or whichever way that the stakeholders want to receive it. And while I'm in word, I'm going to do control and the letter N 
to bring up a new blank document. And then I'm going to switch back over to my project plan. And I'm just going to click on any cell so that I don't have anything selected. Now at this point, you want to make sure that you can see all of the resource names in your resource name column and your Gantt chart, whatever part of it is visible can be shown. I'm going to right click on task zero and choose scroll to task. Oh, that's not going to help me there. So the way it's configured right now, now this time without selecting anything, and even if you had something selected, it's going to override your selection. We're going to go to the drop down arrow next to the copy button on the task tab, and we're going to choose copy picture. So it's going to make a picture of our project plan that can be rendered for the screen directly to the printer or to a GIF image file. We're going to leave it on for screen. We're going to leave the copy setting to rows on the screen and the time scale as shown on the screen. We're going to leave those defaults and we're going to click OK. I'm going to switch back over to my blank Word document and I'm going to do Control V again to paste. And so it's only showing what was shown on the screen, the time scale on the screen. And so it gives me all of the tasks, the entry table that it can see. It cut off my resources here and it shows the part of the Gantt chart that is showing. And I'm going to just close Word without saving any changes. And I'm back in my project plan. So my favorite built-in tool to use to do high-level reporting to stakeholders at this stage of the project is the timeline. So the timeline has been sitting underneath our ribbon the whole time. And what I'm going to have you do is click anywhere up in the timeline so that it's selected. And you see the timeline format tab on your ribbon. And so the first thing we're going to do, if I drag my divider bar backwards so I can see more of my Gantt chart. You'll notice in the timeline, it has this green box. I'm hovering over it right now. And that's basically representing what's showing what's visible on the Gantt chart at this point. And so the first thing I want to do is put my mouse at the green border at the top of that box. So I get a four headed arrow. And I'm going to just drag it backwards to around the start date of the project. And you see the start date at the beginning of the timeline. So I'm going to just adjust that so it starts at the beginning of the project. And now I'm going to grab the rightmost green vertical line. So my mouse looks like a two headed pointer, two headed arrow. I'm going to click and hold and drag it all the way across so that the finish date is showing and mine went a little bit more but so now it's showing more of the project in the Gantt chart so that's what that green area covers it's what's showing in the grant chart in the Gantt chart now we're going to add some tasks to this timeline on that timeline format tab in the insert group you're going to choose existing tasks and it'll bring up a dialog box with all the tasks in your project. And for this example, we're just going to put our stage one task on the timeline. So I'm going to put a check mark in every task in stage one, the summary task and their subtasks. I'm going to just check them all until I get to the bottom of stage one and it's milestone completion task. So I'm just checking the boxes just to make sure we get all the tasks. And as a matter of fact, when you get everything checked, don't check the stage one project planning complete milestone task. I'll show you another way of getting that in the timeline. So after you check all the others, you're going to click OK. And the timeline is kind of overwhelmed with all of those tasks. So we have a lot of white space in the timeline. And because the timeline is going from the start date to the finish date, 
When I look at stage one, it goes from June 21st to July 28th. So one thing that can help is changing the date range to get rid of some of that white space. So on that timeline format tab in the show hide group, I'm going to click on date range and I'm going to choose set custom dates. And for the start date, I'm going to select June 21st. And the finish date is going to be July 28th. And then I'm going to click OK. So it has more space to breathe and space out the different tasks that are in that timeline for that stage. So another thing we can do to make it look better, the first task in that stage, stage one project planning, that's its initial summary task. We're going to select that task and right click on it and choose display as call out. So it takes it out of the timeline proper and it puts it outside of it as a call out. And it just makes the timeline less cluttered, right? Now it's still gonna be looking kind of cluttered here. We can go through and we can, let's see what this one is, ensure total participation. So this one I can barely see. When I click on it and I hover over it, I can see the details of it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that one. I'm actually going to drag down my divider bar between the table and the timeline to get more working space. And what I'm going to do with that one is click and hold on it and drag it outside of the timeline. So it displays as a call out so you can see it better. And these are the things we have to do. So. The, there's another one, create list of target departments. I'm going to drag that above the timeline, make it a call out. So they're not all just bunched together and unreadable. So there's one here that starts with inform, and I'm going to drag that one down. Compile, I'm going to drag up. There's one that looks like it starts with define vendor deliverables. I'm going to drag that one down. And I'm just picking and choosing based on how they look on my timeline. There's one that starts with obtain, and I'm going to drag that up. Uh, create a list of is going to come out to the bottom. As is send skill assessment forms. I'm going to drag that one out and just drop it a little bit lower than the other one so they don't interfere with each other is kind of how you do that. And then there's an initiate end user and I'm going to drag that one up. And so the timeline is looking much better for me now. Now there's another thing that you can do here. We're going to, so we look at the way the dates are formatted in the timeline. And if you wanted to change the date format, you could use that date format drop down. I'm going to leave mine the way it is. And what I want to do is I want to give this timeline a name. So the bar label button in the show hide group, and I'm going to just call this stage one. And so that shows up. Here, I'm going to just drag my green band out of the way because it's showing that part of the project. Okay, so stage one is showing real close to that ensure total participation task. So I'm going to move that task down a little bit so I can see the name of the timeline more clearly. And so now that I have my timeline set up again, it's a very high level reporting tool. I'm going to, on the timeline format tab, I'm going to click on copy timeline and we'll do full size. And then I'm going to just bring up word again. And on the layout tab, I'm going to go to the second button orientation and change it to landscape. And let's see if I can find my Eight and a half by 14. 
not finding my bigger paper size here, but I normally change that. But in either case, I can do control V to paste it in. And you'll see, I mean, it, it pasted in kind of like a picture so I can make it smaller. It pasted in rather like a shape. So I can make it smaller and I'll make the width of it like eight. See what happens, it might be too small. But it's kind of all fitting on the page now. So this is another way and it's a visual way of giving stakeholders initial information about your project before work begins on it. So just as a recap for our second module, which included lessons four and five, um, we started by adding resources to our project plan file and we reviewed the columns on, in resource sheet view and then we input some resources. We input work, material, and cost resources. We entered the cost for our resources as we were adding them to the project plan. And then we created a resource calendar to note some days off for one of our resources. So no work will be scheduled for them on those days. We moved on to assigning our resources to tasks. You learned a couple of different ways of doing that. And then you learned how to resolve resource conflicts, in particular over allocated resources. In the next lesson, we finalized our project plan by optimizing it. That's when we reviewed whether we needed to change any relationship types, where or add some lead or lag time to task. We also added some other resources. We actually performed some more resource assignments that needed to be done and updated a couple of existing resources and watched how that filtered through to the tasks they were already assigned to. After that, we set a baseline so that we'll be able to compare our plan to what actually happens on the project when work starts on the project and we start tracking the actuals. And then we went over a few ways to share the project plan short of sharing the file. We talked about how printing is the most inefficient way. You learned the difference between copying and the copy picture commands. And then lastly, you learned how to populate the timeline and the ways that you can share it for high level reporting for some of your stakeholders. Hi everyone, Trish Connor Cato here. I just wanted to officially thank you for attending this Microsoft Project 2021 video course. And just to recap everything that we covered in this course, we started with a brief review of project management concepts before you learned how to navigate around in the project environment. And then we dove into creating a project plan from a blank template, defining the project by scheduling it from its start date, and creating and assigning a project calendar to the plan. Then we started manually entering some tasks and then we actually pasted some in from within Excel. We began to organize our tasks by creating a work breakdown structure. We created summary and subtasks. We also defined the task relationships. And at that point, Microsoft Project took over the scheduling of our tasks. When we got to the second module, we focused on managing project resources and how to finalize a project plan. So we started adding resources in resource sheet view, including their cost. We created a resource calendar to note a resources exceptions, and we assigned resources to our tasks. We also learned about leveling to resolve over allocated resource conflicts. And then we got into optimizing our project plan, setting a baseline so that we could track our progress on it once work starts, and sharing the plan. Once again, my sincere thanks. Hi everyone, Trish Connor Cato here. 
Welcome to Microsoft Project 2021. This video is for users who are looking to gain skills in Microsoft Project to create, administer, monitor, and report on a project plan's progress. Project is a powerful scheduling tool used to track tasks, resources, and costs. It also provides powerful and interactive reporting tools used through each stage of a project, as you will see during the course. Executing a project, monitoring project progress, and controlling a project plan. We'll learn how to execute the project by entering task project, updating the work done on task, and updating task costs. Globally, this is known as tracking actuals. We'll switch our focus to monitoring the progress of the project plan by viewing the project in a number of ways, adding custom fields, creating custom views, creating a network diagram, so we can look at the project in a flow chart type visual, and analyzing the plan and viewing progress by using task boards and defining sprints. We'll finish the third module after learning ways to control the project plan. This includes editing the task list, rescheduling tasks, splitting tasks, and updating the baseline. The final module of this course zeroes in on how to report on a project and customizing the application. We'll start by formatting and sharing a chart view, viewing the interactive existing reports, creating custom reports, and creating a visual report, which tie in with Excel and or Visio. We'll end the course after reviewing project options, which give you the ability to customize the application to meet your needs. You'll also learn how to create a project plan template, which can be used as a starting point for a future project of a similar type and you will learn how to share resources across project plans and how to link project plan files for more efficient oversight. So now we're gonna get into the launch slash execution phase of project management, starting with our third module. So we have three lessons in this module. The first one is executing a project. And this is known as tracking actuals. So we'll be entering task progress, updating task progress with SharePoint, updating work and updating costs during that lesson. We may also update resource assignments. In the second lesson, we're gonna start monitoring project progress. By viewing it, we'll also be adding custom fields to our project plan creating custom views, creating a network diagram view, analyzing a project plan, and you'll get introduced to task boards, which are another way of monitoring your project progress, and sprints, which allow you to monitor by set segments of time. And then our final lesson in this module is controlling a project plan that may include editing the task list, rescheduling tasks, and updating a baseline. Before we start tracking actuals, we're gonna give ourselves more working space by hiding the timeline. Now this is known as a split view. This is the default view in Microsoft Project. It's called Gantt chart with timeline. So it has the timeline at the top of the screen, the entry table on the left, and the Gantt chart on the right on the bottom half of the screen. We're gonna get rid of that timeline, especially since we added all the tasks to it, and it's taking up a lot of space. So if you go to the View tab on your ribbon, toward the right side, you will see a split view group, and you'll see a check mark in the box in front of timeline. You're gonna go ahead and uncheck it, and we get lots more working space. So now the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to start tracking actuals. And the first one we're gonna track is percent complete. We're gonna say that tasks two and three are 100% complete. So we can do that 
by selecting, I'm just dragging the row handle from two down to three, and go to the task tab of the ribbon. In the schedule group, you'll see a series, and this is just one way of doing this, but you'll see a series of percentage icons, starting with 0%, then 25, 50, 75, and 100. With those two tasks selected, we're gonna go ahead and click on 100%. And you'll notice a couple of things happened. First, the indicator column now has a check mark for each of those tasks. And if you hover over the check mark, it will let you know the date that the task was completed on. On your Gantt chart, if you look at the Gantt bars for those two tasks, they have a thin blue line going all the way through them, which indicates 100% complete. Even with a 25% completion, anything above zero, you'll see a thin blue line in the Gantt bar. So then we decide, you know, that was a mistake. Task three is only 50% complete. So I'm gonna just select task three and use my 50% complete preset button. The check mark disappears from the indicator column because that represents 100% complete. And you can see that the thin blue bar is going halfway through the Gantt bar on the Gantt chart. So far during this course, we've been using this entry table. Now there is another table that we're gonna access that is better suited for tracking actuals, and it's called the tracking table. To get to it, we're gonna to go to the view tab on the ribbon, and you'll see in the data group, you have a tables dropdown. We're gonna go ahead and click it and select tracking off of the list. Now our Gantt chart doesn't change on the right side of the screen. The only thing that changed is our entry table. And it has different columns now. So you have your task name column. I'm gonna just expand this. And then you have the actual start and actual finish date columns. We have percent complete and physical percent complete. And you can see in the percent complete column that it has 100% for task two and 50% for task three. You also have the physical percent complete column. So let's say a task is 50% complete. That's based on the duration. So if it's a one day task, like task three is, and it's 50% complete, then it has a half a day duration remaining. When it's 100% complete, there are zero days remaining duration, and you can see the actual and remaining duration columns. But the other thing is you can have a task that's 50% complete in terms of the duration, but maybe only 40% of the actual work has been done. And that's what's captured by physical percent complete. So if you need to track at that level, you have two different columns. The percent complete is duration based. Physical percent complete is the amount, the percentage of the work that has been done. And they could be different. When we marked task two, 100% complete, it automatically changed the remaining duration to zero days. And since it was a two day task, that's what the actual duration is noted as. We're gonna say that it actually took one day to complete that task. So we're gonna change the actual duration for task two to one day. And when we click away from it, you'll see that the remaining duration has also updated and it is now one day. It was originally a two day task. We marked it 100% complete. 
And then we change the actual duration to one day. It also changed the percent complete to 50%. We're going to say, no, this really only took one day. So we're going to go to the remaining duration and we're going to change it to zero days and we'll click away from it. So now it marked it 100% complete again and it noted that it is only a one day task. And I had collapsed my expansion. So we also have the actual cost and actual work columns in there as well. So based on the resource cost that we put in, it's calculating the actual cost. So the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to do a little bit more tracking on task three. And for this one, this was originally a one day task. And so we marked it 50% complete, half day of actual duration, half day of remaining duration. We want to say that this is a two day task. So we're going to go to the remaining duration and we're going to change it to 1.5 days. So now you'll see that it marked it 25% complete. Half day has already elapsed. Another one and a half days remain. And so when you make a change in project, and you've seen this throughout the course, when you change one thing and then it blue shades other things in the table, those are things that have also updated. And so you can see that our project summary task has updated. Right now it's 1% complete. That's the entire project. Actual duration of 2.05 days, remaining duration, and actual cost and actual work. So it captures everything based on what you're doing in here. So our project was scheduled to start, in my case, I have June 21st of 2022. And we're going to say that it actually started a day early. So in a situation like that, what I like to do is go back to project information and change the project start date first. So we're going to do that. That's project information that we put on the quick access toolbar. And I'm going to just change the start date of the project to the previous working day. Now notice the actual start column is still showing the following day, the original start date, but we actually updated the start date for the previous day. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to do that is because tasks two and three actually got started on the previous day. So now I'm going to go to the actual start date for task two and change it to the previous work day. And I'm going to do the same for task three. And at that point, the actual start date of task zero, the entire project and stage one updated as well. Now, if we hadn't gone and changed the start date, you would have gotten the message. So here, let me just demonstrate this for you. You don't have to do this. So I went back to project information and changed it to the original start date. And I undid these date changes for tasks two and three. So now when I go to change it to the previous day, it's going to give me this planning wizard error. It's not really an error, it's informational. It's letting me know that I moved this task to start before the project start date. And I can either continue and have that happen or cancel. I'm gonna cancel out of here and go back and change the start date. And then it avoids getting that pop-up. So I changed the project start date and now I can set both of these to the 20th and see the shading, the corresponding blue shading. 
nowadays you can sync your project plan file onto a SharePoint site. If you have the ability to access a SharePoint site or the ability to create one, you will be able to do hands-on with this section. If not, and you do gain access in the future, you can always come back and view this portion of the video. It's a two-way sync. So if I update task in SharePoint, they flow down to my project plan and vice versa. And let's go ahead and save our project plan file first. And then we're gonna go to the file tab of the ribbon and we're gonna choose save as on the left. On the bottom of the save as list, you'll see sync with SharePoint. Go ahead and click that. So pardon my privacy blockers on my screen, but you'll notice it says it wants to sync with, in my case, a new SharePoint site, or you can do the drop down and select an existing one. I'm gonna let mine be a new one. And then it gives the project name as the same name of our project plan file. And it gives the site address, the URL to the site address, and it ends with the name of the project plan file. And so it lets you know that a new SharePoint site with a task list will be created at the address above. And the project file will also be saved to the SharePoint site. So we're gonna go ahead and click on save. It will go through several steps and then it will launch the site in your browser window. And now we'll review the site. So right now you're seeing the timeline. You could edit the list and all of this kind of stuff from here. But what normally you're gonna wanna do is go to tasks on the left side navigation. And when you click on task and you scroll down, you'll see your task list. And so the thing is, is that you'll notice this is our task that we marked 100% complete. If we click on ensure total participation task, the next one, you'll see that that is marked 25% complete. We did that in the plan file. And we also changed the start dates for both of those tasks. We're gonna close this. And we're gonna go down in the task list and open the task that says create list of target departments. And so you can't change anything in here unless you click the edit item, the first icon on that view tab of the ribbon. And then it opens everything up. We'll leave it on the same start date and let's just mark it 60%, 60% complete and then save. And so now we're going to switch back over to our project plan file. When I look at task five in my tracking table now, I can see the percent complete has been updated. Go ahead and save your project plan file and it's syncing. So going forward, any changes you make in your plan file when you save, it will sync with that SharePoint list. Let's do another change, another update for task three. Let's go ahead and make it 100% complete. Oops. So many different ways of doing the same thing. So we made it into a two day task, right? And so the actual work is 16 hours. Let's go over to the actual work and change it to 20 hours. So notice it changed the actual duration now to two and a half days to accommodate that. The cost and everything will have updated. So when you do one thing, project logic kicks in 
and the application can do several other things. That's one of the reasons why project is so hard to learn from scratch. Like if you're self-taught, a lot of things happen. Nowadays there's Google, so that makes it a lot easier, but it can be a little bit tricky in its behind the scenes logic. Let's go down to task 33. That's the one where we have the material resources assigned. So we're going to go ahead, and this is, again, just for training purposes. We're getting ahead in our schedule, which is fine. But let's mark that one 100% complete. And it calculates the actual cost for that material resource as $5,769.23. We're going to change that. There was a price increase, and so we're going to make it 6500 the actual cost of that one. And so now when we look up at task zero, as of right now with everything we've tracked, the actual cost of the project is $7,240.38. Go ahead and save your project plan file. Now that we've tracked our actuals, we're going to go ahead and start looking at a few different ways to view our project progress to date. So we're going to start by using a different view. There is another view called tracking Gantt that we're going to switch to. So on my left side of the screen, I'm going to go to my Gantt chart view indicator and right click and I'm going to select tr Tracking Gantt. Now, we were on our tracking table, but when we switched to the Tracking Gantt view, it switched us back to the entry table. And the focus is on the differences in the Gantt chart here. So you'll notice a lot of the task bars have a percentage next to them. Everything except milestone tasks will have the percentage. And then you have two different color bars. The blue bar is your task bar, and the gray bar would be your baseline. So if you look at, I'll show you a good example that's really good to see on the Gantt chart. And this one is for task number two on the Gantt chart. You'll notice the task bar, the blue bar, is in front of the gray bar. That task started early. The baseline start date was June 21st, in my case, and we changed it to the 20th. So you can see that that one is ahead of schedule. And so is the next one, task three. It's ahead of schedule. And so the tracking GAN, and it shows you the ones that have any percentage of completion noted including your summary task, it will show that as the percentage. So that's just one way, just a visual way of tracking the progress of your project. Another way of viewing your project's progress in a table format is by using the variance table. I'm gonna switch back to Gantt chart view and because we were in our tracking table, it's still in that table. And we're gonna just simply switch to another table. So we're gonna go to the View tab, go back to your Tables dropdown, and this time select Variance. So this table shows you your start and finish dates compared to your baseline start and finish dates. And then it shows the start and or finish variants. So notice tasks two and three, they started early. So they have a negative one day start variance. And task two also has a negative two day finish variance. So this is another way of seeing how you're doing right now. Our project is in pretty good shape, but we haven't tracked a lot of the actuals in here, and that can change over time. And a really simple way 
to view your project's progress is from the Project Information dialog box. So I'm going to access it from the Quick Access Toolbar. And in the lower left corner, I'm going to click on Statistics. And so now we have where we currently are, our start and finish dates, versus the baseline and our actuals. We also have our variances listed in the top half of the screen. The bottom half deals with duration, work, and cost. So we can see our current and our baseline. So duration, we're ahead of where we should be. We're also ahead of, in work. And we're a little bit over cost right now but we added a significant amount to that material resource. So that explains that. And then we see what we have actually, and then what is remaining. In the lower left corner, we'll see our percent complete for duration and work for the overall project. And we can close project statistics. Now, when we get to the next module, you'll learn how to view your project's progress by using the reporting features in Microsoft Project. For right now, let's go ahead and save our project plan, and then you're gonna learn how to add custom fields to your plan file. Earlier, when we were working in resource sheet view, we saw a couple of fields, group and code, that project added to that view that you can use for whatever you want and you can report on them. We use the group field to say whether it was an internal resource or an external resource type of thing. But in addition to that, you can create additional custom fields in project. And this is a pretty cool feature. Let's start by going to the project tab on the ribbon. And in your properties group, you'll see custom fields and go ahead and click on it. So you have basically two types of fields starting at the top. It's defaulting to task fields. You also have resource fields. And if you're on project server, you will have project fields there. So for your task fields, if you go over to the right and you look at the text dropdown, right? There's a variety of different types of fields that you can have. So text, cost, date, so on and so forth. And then you also have resource fields. And again, they come in multiple types, just like text fields. Go back to task and it defaults to text. And if you scroll down that field list where it starts with text one through, you have up to 30 tasks, text fields that you can add to your project plan file. Go to your text drop down and choose cost. You have 10 cost fields for a task that you can add to your project plan file. And take it back to text. So we've decided that we want to add a field in resource sheet view that lists a department for our resources. So for the type of field, we're going to switch to resource here. We're going to leave it on text and it's on text one. Right under the list of text fields, with text one selected, we're gonna click the rename button and we're gonna just name it department. Now project's name for it will remain text one. So when you look in the field list now, you'll see that that is in parentheses after your name for it, department. We want this to be a drop down list field. So the users or you, whoever's working in the plan file can just use the drop down list to select a department as opposed to having to type it in. 
So under custom attributes, we're going to do the option button for lookup and then click on the lookup button. And we're basically going to type in our list of departments here, pressing enter after each one. So you don't have to type them in alphabetical order. We're going to type training and then enter. The next one is human resources marketing and then we're going to have one called vendor and the reason why we don't have to have them in alphabetical order is we because we can change the display order for the lookup table down below so i'm going to expand that by clicking the plus sign so it defaults to by row number so that means it would be in the order that we typed it in we're going to select sort ascending and then on the right, you're going to click the sort button. And down at the bottom, we can click close. And we can click OK on the custom fields box. Go ahead and navigate to resource sheet view. And we have more over allocations and they've been happening as we've been updating our task progress. But for right now, what we want to do is we want to add that department column, but I would like to add it right next to the resource name column to the right of the resource name column. So I'm going to right click on the type column heading and choose insert column. And I'm going to start typing department and you'll see department text one comes up and you can press enter. And notice it now has, and I'll just expand that field, has a drop down arrow. So starting from the top, I'll give you the departments. Um, Emily, Teresa, Eugenia, and Anita are in training. So you can go ahead and use your drop down. And this keeps more consistency in here as well. If people are typing it in, it could be, you know, could be interesting. And then we have Randy and Alan and Art in Human Resources. Alice is in Marketing. And then our two vendors are our vendor. It's not really a department, but we want to note it that way. So that is our first example of a custom field. So now we're going to add another custom field. This one is going to be a text, uh, excuse me, a task text lookup field. And it's also going to be using a graphical indicator to display in the field. So we can, on the project tab, we can go back into custom fields. We're going to change it, make sure it's on task at the top. We're going to leave it on text and we're going to rename text one in here to progress. Go down to custom attributes, do your option button for lookup and then click on lookup. And we're going to type early on track and then behind schedule. And we're going to leave them in that order. So we're not going to change the display order. We'll leave it by row number. And we're going to click close at the bottom. And then on the custom field screen, all the way at the bottom under values to display, you're going to select the option button for graphical indicators and then click on the graphical indicators button. So we're going to be working where it says test for progress values and an image up here. We're doing this for our non summary rows. So in the first test for progress, you're going to do a drop down and select equals. And then in the values column to the right of that, you're going to type early, just like we put on our lookup list. 
And then you're going to go over to the image and do the drop down. And we're going to select the green flag. We're going to go to the next test for progress and choose equals again. This time we want the value to be on track and we're going to give it the yellow flag as an image. And set up the last one so it equals behind schedule and give it the red flag. And since, since we have our three tests set up, we can go ahead and click OK. And we can OK again. And then switch to Gantt chart view. And we're going to add, oh, let's switch to our entry table. So let's go to the View tab, Tables drop down, Entry. And I'm going to expand it. And we're going to put this, I don't need this to be this wide. We're going to put this all the way to the right. So where it says add new column, I'm going to click right there on add new column. And I'm going to start typing progress. And you see your progress text one is highlighted. I'm going to press enter. And then I'm going to go down to task two and do the drop down. And I'm going to select early and it shows the green flag. I'm going to do the same for task three. So that's a combination lookup and graphical indicator text field. You can also create custom views in Microsoft Project. So we're going to create a split view. We want our Gantt chart and then we want a task details form on the bottom half of the screen. So we'll have our entry table and Gantt chart just as it is, but we're going to have a split on the bottom of the screen when we're done. So to create a custom view, you're going to start on the view tab of the ribbon. And in the task views group, you're going to click on the other views drop down. And at the very bottom, you're going to click on more views. And then on the right, you're going to click on new. So we're going to do a combination view because we want a split view as opposed to a single view. So go ahead and click combination view and click OK. So now it wants you to give your view a name. And we're going to call it Gantt with task details. And then we're going to have our primary view. We're going to do the drop down and select Gantt chart. And then the details, we're going to select a view named task details form. And we want to be able to show it from the other views menu or any view menu. So we'll leave that box checked and we'll click OK. And then we'll click Apply. And you'll see now that the Gantt chart and the entry table are on the upper half of your screen. And you have a task form on the bottom half. So on the upper half, I'm on task two. If I click into task three, my task form updates. So this is a way that I can get to additional information about the task and even use that form at the bottom to change information. So I don't always have to go to task information and get into all of that stuff. So that is a benefit of having a split view. Now, if you go to your other views drop down again on the view tab, you'll see that it's just showing some of your built-in views. Go back to more views 
And if you scroll through the list, you will see your Gantt with task details because we said show it in the menu. And you can cancel out of that. Now, if you wanted to at this point, just get back to your Gantt chart view, you can double click the divider line between the upper and lower half of your screen and it will make your secondary view go away. Now, there's another thing. Go to your other views in the task views group drop down. Go back to more views and select your Gantt with task details view again. You can double click it or click it once and do apply. And so if you look at the view tab in the split view group, you can see that we're not showing the timeline here, so that's unchecked, but details is checked now. And the details section is the bottom half of the screen and it's showing your task details form. So another way of getting rid of it is just by unchecking details. Some people like to look at their project plans in a flow chart type format. And so there is another view that I'm going to show you now. Let's right click on our view indicator and we're going to go to network diagram view. So in network diagram view, it has that flow chart field. And let me explain what's going on here. So your parallelogram shapes, those are all of your summary tasks. So task zero, it shows the name of the task, its start date, its ID, the finish date, the duration, and the percent complete. You'll notice that these have a slash through them, and that's because work has started on them. So training rollout initiative, that's our task zero, and stage one, work has started on. So there's a slash mark through their parallelograms. And then you have your rectangles, which are your subtasks. So we have one here. This is stage one, right? So before I start looking at the subtasks, let me do this differently. We have this line coming out and going down from stage one. If I scroll down, you'll see that it's then pointing to stage two. If I continue scrolling down, you'll see stage three. So they're all connected kind of in that way. Your summary task, starting with your summaries, not task zero. And then up top, you have the subtasks for stage one. So define objectives and describe, and that has a double slash through it because that is 100% complete, right? We have another one here, and then we have this one that is partially complete showing here. And this is another summary task, and these are its subtasks. So you can see the slash is partially complete. And if I scroll across to the right, I'll be able to view, continue viewing. So you have the ability to view your project in this manner. And when you're in this view, network diagram view, you get a network diagram format tab on your ribbon. So you can show and hide different things if you want. So if I want to uncheck progress marks, you see those slashes go away. If I want to not see project summary task, I can uncheck it there. If you check link labels, so you're seeing your finish to start relationship types showing on those link lines. And then you also have straight links. So it's kind of pointing to everything that's associated with it. And we can go back to Gantt chart view. Before we get into analyzing our project plan, let's go over some definitions. So the first one is what is Slack? You have two different types of Slack in Microsoft project. 
Free slack is the number of days that a task can have before it starts delaying its successor task. So if task one is going to be delayed, it could potentially delay task two or whatever its successor task is. So free slack would be the number of days that it has, the amount of wiggle room that it has before it starts delaying its successor task. And then total slack is the number of days a task can have before it starts delaying the entire project. So free slack is task to task. Total slack is task to entire project. And then other definitions you're going to need to know are about slipping and late task. So they're slightly different. Slipping tasks or tasks that have a forecasted finish date that is greater than the baseline finish date. They may be scheduled to start late, have already started late, or are taking longer than planned. Then you have late task, and that one is running behind both the baseline start and finish dates. They may or may not have started. They may have started on time, but will finish late. They may have started early, but will finish late, or they might just be finishing late. So keep those in your back of your mind while we analyze our project plan. Before we get started, let's go ahead and level our plan again. We've been tracking actuals and doing other things in here that have caused us to have over allocated resources again. So this time what we're gonna do on the resource tab in the level group, we're gonna just select level all. And we still have some minor allocations, there's several surrounding those daily calls, but they're only an hour. That wouldn't really raise a flag for me. And so we only have a few left and that's good. So now we can actually start analyzing our plan. The first thing we're gonna do is go to the Gantt chart format tab on the ribbon. And in the bar styles group, you'll see that you have a series of three checkboxes, critical tasks, slack, and late tasks. So we talked about slack and late tasks on the slide. Um, what you're not seeing here are slipping tasks. And we didn't talk about critical tasks because you're gonna learn about those right now. So let's check the box in front of critical tasks and look at your Gantt chart. And you'll see that you have several tasks, if you scroll across it and down, that now are not with a blue bar, but they have like a salmon colored bar based on my color scheme. Those are critical tasks. So what is a critical task? A critical task is a task that could potentially delay the project's finish date if it goes off schedule. Now, typically, and what we have here is a highly sequential task list. We usually with a task list, you put the task in the order that they're gonna happen on your project. You outline your tasks by creating summary tasks and so on and so forth. And so whenever you have a highly sequential task list, there's always going to be critical tasks. And that's how they show up on the Gantt chart. We're gonna uncheck critical tasks on the ribbon. So now we're gonna take a look at Slack and that's on the same bar styles group on the Gantt chart format tab. You can check the box in front of Slack. And you'll notice if you right click on task nine and scroll to task, you'll see your task bar, right? Your blue bar to the right of it, the resource. And the resource name seems to be sitting on top of like a thin black line. That is the line that indicates slack. And if I hover my mouse, just so over that line, a screen tip will pop up and it's telling me, it's showing the free slack, not total slack. It's telling me 
This task is scheduled to be finished on the 27th, but you can let it go until August 4th without having an impact on any successor tasks, perhaps forcing them to cause the project to go over schedule. So that's a lot of slack on that task. Now, there are other ways that you can view your slack, your critical tasks, and I'll show those to you in a moment. In the meantime, go ahead and uncheck the slack box. They are check boxes, so you could have critical, slack, and late tasks checked. And this time, click on late task. And I don't think I'm looking to see. No, we don't have any in our project plan. So we can uncheck that. So I'm going to show you how to create a custom table that shows all of these fields that you can use to analyze your plan, like whether a task is critical, both free and total slack, if it's late, if it's slipping. So on the view tab of the ribbon, you're going to go to your tables drop down and at the bottom select more tables. On the right side, choose new. And we're going to name it project analysis. On the right side, this one doesn't default. So the right side of where you put the name, you're going to check show in menu. And then what we're going to do is click in the first field name, do the drop down, or you can start typing. And we're going to start typing critical. And when critical pops up, we're going to just tab. We're going to go down to the second field name and start typing free. And free slack will pop up and tab. Underneath free slack, we're going to do total slack. And underneath total slack, we'll put um, late. So it has late finish or late start. We'll leave late off of here. And let's try slipping. And that doesn't show up either. So we'll be able to see, oops. Okay, I got to get rid of that. We'll be able to see our critical and free slack, critical free and total slack in this new table that we create. So we're going to go ahead and click OK there. Why am I getting this? I have something in the field that shouldn't be there. And now that I work through that, when I clicked OK, project analysis is selected and I can apply. And so now I can see free and total slack. Well, actually, I guess we should have put the task name in there. So let's go back. We'll edit what we did. We'll add the task name. That would be helpful. And I noticed we didn't uncheck the default of lock first column. So we'll fix that as well. So we're going to go back to our tables, drop down more tables with project analysis selected. Go to edit on the right. And let's insert a row. So critical is already selected. Insert a row to go above it. And let's type name in there. So we get the task name. That will be helpful. And then underneath where your check boxes are, you're going to uncheck lock first column and click OK and apply. So now I can expand the name column and just expand everything so I can see what's critical and the amount of free and total slack. They'll often be the same number, but sometimes they'll be different if there's both. For example, if you look at stage one project planning, it has zero days of free slack. So we can't push that stage back at all without impacting a successor task. But we do have five and a half days of total slack for wiggle room that won't impact the project end date. And we can go back to our tables drop down and switch it back to your entry table. And now we'll view slippage on our Gantt chart. So we're on that Gantt chart format ribbon tab. In the bar styles group, we're going to do the slippage drop down and select baseline. 
So now you will have these little thin bars on your Gantt chart. I'm hovering over one now. And the screen tip pops up, slippage, right? It gives me the name of the task. Its baseline start date is August 2nd, but the task start date is scheduled for August 10th. So that's why it's coming up with slippage. And I'm going to go back to the slippage drop down and uncheck baseline. Now we're going to go into sorting, filtering, highlighting, and grouping. And this will be mostly in your entry table. So I'm going to drag my Gantt chart divider bar all the way over to the right. I just want to focus on the table for right now. And so if you go to the view tab of the menu, and it's in the same group where you have your tables drop down, you have your highlight there, you have your filter, you have your group by, and you also have your sort. So if I go to the sort drop down, I can sort my project by start date, finish date, cost, or ID. And so let's do by cost. And so we're not showing a cost field here. Let's right click on the duration column heading, go to insert column, start typing in cost and press enter. So you can see that we have it sorted by cost. So what's happened here, stage three came up to the top underneath task zero because stage three has the highest cost. That's kind of how that's working. And then stage four and then stage two and then stage one. Now to undo that sort, we're gonna go back to the sort drop down and you're going to choose by ID. So that's the row numbers. So that's how you can undo that sort. You can also group your task list in addition to, you know, your default groupings of summary task and subtask. So in that data group on the view tab, go to the no group drop down and choose duration. Yeah. So by the way, when you have a grouping applied, you don't even want to try to look at your Gantt chart because it's crazy. It's based off of the grouping. So what it's done is it looked for everything that had a duration of zero days. That's our milestone task. They're all grouped together. Our roll numbers are all over the place. Then our calls are like 0.13 days. Then we have our one day task, one and a half, 1.6, two days, so on and so forth. So we group by duration. Now go back to your duration. Now duration drop down for group by. And at the top, click on no group. In project, you have two different types of filters that you can apply to your plan. I call the first one a column filter, which is specific to a particular column. And then you have more of a global filter. You can use them separately or you can use them together. We're going to use both of them now. The first one we're going to do is a column level filter on the cost column. So we're going to go to the drop down arrow to the right of the cost column heading, hover over filters and choose between. So it says show rows where cost, it goes to is within. We're going to do the drop down next to is within, and we're going to choose is greater than or equal to. In the text box to the right, we're going to type 300. We're going to go to the next text box under the and or, and do is less than or equal to. And then we're going to put in 500. So we want to show rows where the cost is basically between 300 and 500, including both of those numbers. And we're going to click OK. So now your entire task list for your subtask, okay, this doesn't apply to your summary task, 
but it's only showing those that are between $300 and $500. Now we can apply a more global filter on top of this. So what we're going to do is on the view tab in the data group, we're going to go to the no filter drop down and we're going to click on using resource and we're going to do the drop down and select Teresa Brown and click OK. So now it's showing the tasks that Teresa Brown is assigned to that are between $300 and $500 in cost. Now let's clear those filters. We're going to go to what used to be the drop down arrow next to the cost column heading. We're going to click that funnel and just click on clear filter from cost. And then we're going to go to the filter drop down that says using resource and at the top select no filter. Go ahead and save your plan file. Let's do another global filter using a resource. So I'm going to my no filter drop down using resource. And this time let's do the drop down and select Anita Redman and click OK. So it's only showing tasks that she's involved in. Now notice it collapsed your list. You know, you're not seeing your whole list. You can see that by looking at your row numbers, it skips from row one to row 11. It skips from 14 to 23. So you're not seeing your entire task list. You're only seeing the rows of interest, which are the ones that Anita Redman is assigned to. Now you might want your list to be intact and have the effect of a filter. So let's go up to the filter using resource and choose no filter. And right above that, go to no highlight drop down. Choose using resource and then do the drop down and select Anita Redman again and click OK. So your list stays intact and your rows of interest are highlighted. Go ahead and go to your highlight drop down and choose no highlight at the top. Another way that you can analyze your project plan, and you may be familiar with some of these terms if your team uses Agile or the Scrum method, there is now a tie-in in project using what are known as task boards and sprints. And so it's another way of analyzing your plan. And we're going to start by using setting up our task boards. And we can access task boards from the view tab. It's in the task views group. You can do the drop down and select task board. And you'll notice that there are tasks already. All of your tasks basically are on the not started section of this task board. And so we're going to modify this. What we're going to do is for not started, we're going to leave it named that way. And you'll learn how to move these completed tasks in a little while, right? We're not going to use the next up one. So I'm going to right click on that and delete it. We just want not started in progress and done. That's all we want, but we want to change what shows on the cards. So right now it's just showing the name, the resource, and the check mark for percent, you know, 100% complete. So we're going to go to the task board format tab. And in the customize group, we're going to click on customize cards. We want to check the box in front of show task ID. And then you can add up to five additional fields in addition to these three base fields. So we're going to do the first drop down and we're going to select percent complete. And we're going to do the second drop down and start typing sprint. And you can press enter when it shows on the list. Now we haven't set up sprints yet. You'll learn about those in just a few moments. 
we're going to click OK. So now if we look at any task card, we have the percent complete. We have sprint and all of it says no sprint because we haven't done anything with the sprints yet. And we have the task ID, which is our row numbers showing. So the first button on the task board format tab is sheet. Click on it and it takes you to task board sheet view. And you can see you have your no sprint column there. You have your indicators column. Your task may be slightly out of order on this view at this moment, but what I can do, let's see, what we want to focus on here is how to move it from task board to task board. So if you notice the ones that have the check marks in the indicator column, you see the board status says not started. And we're going to do the drop down where it says not started and choose done. So do that for everything that has a check mark. I think there's only three of them there with a check mark. Done. And that's kind of how that works. And then we know that we can add a new column here. This might be helpful. And we're going to just choose percent complete. And so we have this other task at the top that is 60% complete. So task five, and I'm going to go to board status and I'm going to choose in progress for that one. And then I can go back to my view tab and go back to, and you can click the upper half of the task board button to get into it. And you can see how your tasks are now distributed between the three different boards that we have there. Go ahead and save your project. So your task boards work in conjunction with sprints. Sprint is like a time phase layer in addition to like your task start and finish dates. So you can look at your project by sprint, meaning by the duration of this time phase layer. We're going to set up one month sprints for our project plan. And we can do that by going to the project tab of the ribbon. And in the properties group, you're going to click on manage sprints. So it gives you a default no sprint with zero days length. And then it gives you a beginning sprint, sprint one, right? And, and it's two weeks. We're going to change that to four weeks. Now you may, if you use the up arrow button to change the time, you'll get three EW, that's estimated week. I'm going to keep going up and I get four EW. I don't want the E, I just want the W. So just four week sprints. And when I tab, it starts with my project start date and it goes out for a period of four weeks. And then down at the bottom, I'm going to click add sprint. And this one is giving me a two weeker as well. I want it to be four. So I'm going to just change these to four weeks. If you wanted to do two week sprint, you're set because that's what its default is. Otherwise, oops, I have to go back into my manage sprints. I moved too fast there. And so, and normally I would do this for the duration of the project. We're just going to add two more sprints and make them four weeks just so we don't have to keep going all the way until next February is when it ends. Just so you can see how this kind of works. Then I'll add the last one and make that one four weeks as well. Oops. And then I'm going to click OK at the bottom. And you have, you're on the sprints tab of the ribbon now, and you can get back into managing your sprints from that ribbon tab. And then you have views. If you go to your sprint view drop down arrow, you can see current sprint board. Let's go there first, right? And it's just showing the current sprint, which is the current the beginning of the project for the first month, right? 
And then we're going to go, and you don't see any tasks here. You're going to go back to your sprint drop down and go to current sprint sheet. And you don't see anything here either because we don't have any tasks assigned to any sprints at this point. You're going to go to your task board drop down and go to task board sheet. And when I scroll up here, you'll see everything is assigned to no sprint. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get rid of the percent complete column because I don't need it here right now. So I'm going to right click on its heading and hide column. And then I'm going to add a new column and I'm going to start typing start. So I want the start date of the task and we're going to put it in sprints by the start date. So for the first two tasks, right? Two and three, we're going to do the drop down and select sprint one. So all the tasks up to and including task 18 are in sprint one. Go ahead and set that up and just put 19 through 21 in sprint two. Now let's go to your sprint drop down and go to current sprint board. So this is sprint one and we're seeing it populate with tasks, right? And with the task cards not started in progress and done. We can go back to the sprint drop down and from there you just have your sprints and you have your current sprint sheet if you wanna take a look at that now. So this is just sprint one. It's the current time phase that we're in. And then we're going to go to the planning drop down and we can go to sprint planning board. And here you have your no sprint. So all the tasks that are in no sprint, the ones that we assigned to sprint one and the ones that we've assigned to sprint two. So if you know that you're looking at a month at a time, that's a different view of your project. You could name your sprints, stuff like that, but I'm just saying this is another way that you can analyze how your project is doing. You're looking at it with this time phase overlay of a month, right? And so, and we based it, I based the sprints off of the start date of the tasks for those months. So just another way of analyzing your project. Go ahead and save your project plan file. So I'm going to go back to manage on that sprints tab, and I'm going to have you do this on your own. You're going to rename sprints one through four, month one, month two, month three, month four, something like that. Go ahead and do that and then click OK. So now that they're named appropriately, it will make more sense when you're analyzing. Now we're going to get started on the last lesson in this module, which is controlling a project plan. We'll be editing the task list by deleting a task and setting what's known as a deadline task. We are also going to be splitting tasks, learning about task constraints, rescheduling tasks, and updating a baseline. So I'm gonna challenge you now. I'm gonna have you switch back to Gantt chart view and delete task 46. Once you've done that, go to the very bottom of your task list and click in the first blank task name cell. So we're gonna set a deadline task here. I noticed the finish date of the project. Let me go take another peek at that. February, yeah, February 17th, 2023. So I'm going to say that we have a couple of weeks wiggle room at the absolute latest. This project needs to be finished by February 28th. So I'm going to set a deadline of February 28th. And what it does is only helpful kind of after the fact, right? So it will put an indicator, a green arrow on your Gantt chart for the deadline date. 
And if you blow past the deadline, that arrow will turn red and you'll get an indicator in the indicator column. So in that last, the first empty task name, we're going to just type project deadline. That's what we'll name this deadline task. And press enter. And then click on it and outdent it one level from the task tab. And now what we're going to do is we're going to double click it to get into task information dialog box. And on the advanced tab, you'll see the deadline is set to non applicable. We're going to do the drop down there, navigate to February of the following year and select the last day of the month and click OK. Now on your Gantt chart, you can scroll to the right until you get to February of next year in that particular week, the last week of the month. And you'll see the green arrow indicating your deadline date on your Gantt chart. And like I said, if you go past February 28th, that arrow will turn red and you'll get an indicator in the indicators column. So that's what a deadline task does for you in project. Now let's say you have a resource that starts work on a task. And then let's say it's a multi-day task and they put in like two days of the work and then they call out sick for two days. There's not another resource that can be assigned to that task. So you have to be able to note that in your project plan file somehow. And the way you do that is by splitting the task and then adding a task note. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to task six and you're going to right click on it and scroll to task. So the Gantt bar comes into view. And we can see that Teresa is assigned to that seven day task. And so the task is starting on a Friday and we're going to say that she works Friday, Monday and Tuesday of the following week. And then she's out sick Wednesday and Thursday. So that'll be our scenario. She works Friday, Monday, Tuesday, then she's out sick Wednesday and Thursday, then she returns on Friday. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we're on the right task bar on the Gantt chart, perform departmental training needs analysis. And on the task tab, and you may want to watch me do this first and then do it on the task tab of the ribbon in the schedule group, you will see the split task button. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on it and you'll notice a couple of things as I move my mouse around. There's like a white pop-up box that seems to be attached to my weird looking mouse pointer. Looks like two vertical lines and a right pointing arrow. And so what I want to do is I want to hover over that task bar for task six on the Gantt chart. And as I move my mouse to the right over that bar, you'll see on the right side, the schedule start date comes up, right? And it's going to Sunday. So it starts on a Friday and then I'm on Saturday, Sunday. I'm going to get to Monday. So she worked on Friday, Monday and Tuesday. And when it gets to Wednesday, the 29th, I'm going to click my mouse on that bar and it splits the task bar. Now it only split it for one day. So in the scenario, she's having Wednesday and Thursday off sick. So I'm going to put my mouse on top of the right side of the split bar. It looks like a four headed arrow. I'm going to click and hold and drag that side to the right one more day until the task start says Friday in the white pop-up box. So now she worked on Friday, 
Monday and Tuesday. She called out sick Wednesday and Thursday. And then she resumed her work on the task on Friday. And that's how it's represented on the Gantt chart. And by the way, when you're leveling, when you're having project level for you, one of the things that may do to get rid of the over allocation for a resource is it may split some tasks. So if you see a task bar with a split and a dotted line in between it, it means it's been split. Once you split a task, you may want to document the reason why, and you do that via task notes. I'm going to double click task six to get into the task information dialog box. And on the notes tab, I'm going to date the note. It's going to be weird because I'm doing the split in advance, but I'm going to date and initial the note and I'm going to say, Teresa called out due to illness on 628-2922. And then I'll just go ahead and click OK so it's documented. Another situation you may run into when you're controlling your project plan is having to apply a constraint to a task. Let's take a look at task 69. It's discussing the results with the vendor for any improvements. And it's currently scheduled to start on September 26th. It's a two day task, so it'll end on Tuesday the 27th, right? Okay, so this is the thing. The vendor says that they are unable to meet at all that week. They're going to be out of town and they will be able to meet toward the end of the following week. So we need to apply a constraint on that task and we do it from task information. So let's double click task 69. And if you go to the advanced tab, you'll see the constraint type it defaults to as soon as possible. Now we talked about that very early in the course. When we scheduled our project from its start date, it gives all tasks the constraint type of as soon as possible. So whenever there's room in the schedule, that task can start as soon as possible. And then when you do the drop down arrow, you'll see as late as possible. That's the default if you schedule your project from a finish date. So it does reverse logic on almost everything. Then you have, and those are considered fairly flexible constraints, the as soon as possible and as late as possible constraints. Then you have semi-flexible constraints. Finish no earlier than or finish no later than. The task can finish no earlier than a particular date or no later than a particular date. And if you select one of those, then you have to give it a constraint date on the right side. And then back to the list, I'm going to skip the must finish on and must start on for right now. At the bottom of the list, you have start no earlier than and start no later than. They also require a constraint date and they're also semi-flexible. The ones that you want to avoid as much as possible is what we call hard constraints. The task must finish on a specific date or must start on a specific date. If you choose those constraints, one of those constraints for a task, then project cannot reschedule that task no matter what is going on in the schedule, whether it comes to leveling or anything else. It is set in stone. So you want to avoid those as much as possible. So I said that the vendor is not available until late in the following week. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the constraint type is start no earlier than. That's semi-flexible. So this task, this meeting with the vendor 
can't start any earlier than, and then for the constraint date, I'm going to put in the following, let's see, that would be the week of September 26th it was scheduled. So I'm going to put in October 6th. So that's semi-flexible. Project can schedule around it. And it's going to shift our schedule. So we're going to click OK. And then you get all your blue shading of everything that was pushed back. You know, your successor task would be pushed back. And the phase changed as well. We look at task 76 and we realize that we have the party scheduled for a Tuesday and everybody's agreed that they're available on the following Saturday. Well, Saturday and Sundays are not considered working days in project, but we can change it anyway. And that's what we're going to do now. So we're dealing with task 76 and we're simply going to go to its start date field and do the drop down arrow. And we're going to select Saturday, September 24th. Now, as soon as we do that, the planning wizard pops up. It's very helpful. So it's a couple of things have happened here, right? It's telling us that we are moving it away. We're attempting to move it away from a link task. And now the link between the tasks will not drive the start date of this task. In addition, the new start date is a non-working day. So we can, we, this is a two part process here because it's a link task. If it wasn't a link task, we would only get the message about the new start date is a non-working day. But so the first thing we have to do is remove the link and it's going to move it to start the following working day after the Saturday that we chose. So we're going to remove the link. We're going to click OK. And so now it changed it to the following work day, but it no longer has a link. We're going to go to the start date drop down and we're going to choose Saturday, September 24th. And this is where we get you moved it to a non working day. But we can override that by making Saturday, September 24th, a working day. And that would only apply to this task. So it's not going to schedule any other task on that day, just this task. So make that choice and click OK. And now we'll have the party on that Saturday. Now notice that you have an, a calendar icon in your indicator. So by doing that, it created a start no earlier constraint for that task. It can't start any earlier than that Saturday. Go ahead and save your project plan file. So a lot of times many unexpected or a few unexpected things may happen during the life cycle of a project. And so I'm going to give you two scenarios here and how you would handle them in your project plan file. And for this, we're going to be focusing on our stage four tasks, except for task 69 and the party task. So we're going to do two things. Let's say that the stakeholders have informed you that you may have to push stage four out. We'll just say due to budget reasons. And so we, at this point, it's not confirmed. We don't want to remove them from the project schedule, but we need to start looking at the schedule as if those tasks may not be in it on the schedule. So we're going to go ahead and select from task 65 to task 68 and then hold down your control key and select from 70 down to 75. And we'll leave the deadline there for, and the party okay is fine. So now what we want to do is we want to go to the project pass tab of the ribbon for this one. 
So we have the tasks selected that may or may not have to be rescheduled or even removed from the project plan. And on the task tab in the schedule group, you're going to click inactivate. And it leaves those tasks in your project plan. They're dimmed out, they're crossed out. And the only thing that you would have to do, so task 69 somehow got inactivated too. So I just manually, I guess my selection wasn't right, but I manually reactivated that one and I'm gonna reactivate the party one as well. And so if they say, hey, everything is fine, all we have to do is select them and clicking inactivate will reactivate them. Now, there is one thing you have to be aware of when you do that. Out of the inactivated tasks, let's say task 67, for example, is now inactive. If that is a predecessor for task 76, we would have to go to task 76 and change its predecessor manually because task 67 is now inactive. And then vice versa, if we reactivate it, we would have to then relink it to task 67, if that were the situation. We're gonna select the inactive tasks and you're gonna click your inactivate button to activate them again. And I did the opposite. My selecting skills here are not very admirable. So that whole stage is activated again. So that's one scenario, nothing set in stone. They may run, but in the meantime, let's just temporarily inactivate them so they're not interfering with our other work on the project. The other scenario is we're not gonna be able to do stage four until starting in May of next year for financial reasons. The entire stage, except for the meeting with the vendor, we'll keep that meeting. So I'm gonna start selecting the tasks. And then I'm gonna select the rest of the tasks. I know why I'm clicking the wrong button. I'm doing my shift instead of control, here we go. And so I'm gonna leave the party intact and the deadline. So all the other stage four tasks are selected. And this time we're gonna go to the project tab of the ribbon. On the project tab toward the right side of the ribbon in the status group, you will see update project and we're gonna click on it. So by the way, if everything is going like gravy on your project and all your tasks are starting on time and completing on time, you can use this box to say update work as complete through and pick a date and you can set it to either of these choices, right? And then you can use this update project box for our purpose here, which is to reschedule uncompleted work to start after. We're gonna do the drop down there and we're gonna navigate to May of next year. And we'll start, we'll select May 1st. And it's not for the entire project, be careful here. It's only for those selected tasks. Now, if you did leave entire project and you did okay, you could do control Z to undo. We're gonna click okay. So now you're seeing how it pushed out all of that work. We said start after May 1st, so it's literal. It's starting them on May 2nd. That's how that's working. So they've been pushed out, which means that if I go to the top, 
Now the finish date is not until October of next year. And if I go to my deadline marker, which was set for February 28th of next year on the Gantt chart, let me get into February. Here we are. And then scroll down to the deadline task and scroll to it. So we can see at this point, we haven't gotten to that date yet, right? In reality, we haven't gotten to that date. We're just scrolling to it. But at this point, if that is going to be pushed out that far, we might want to consider updating our deadline and making a note about why we're updating it. So that deadline arrow is still fine for February 28th. It will flip to red on February 29th. Now that we've made all of these changes to our project plan, particularly rescheduling stage four, we should probably update our baseline. So let's do this. Let's um, go to the view tab and go to our tables drop down and select variants. And let's see. So we see if we look down at stage four, we have a two month variance there, start date variance, right? That's a lot. I mean, if we go to, let's go back to our entry table. And we're going to just update our existing baseline at this point. So we can go to the project tab. And before we do that, I just want to point out something here that I think is particularly useful. Let's say that we're already in like January of next year. And we want to look at something in our project. We want to get the status of what the project was like in August of this year. So you can put in a status state in this status group on the project tab. You can click on that NA and select a status state, and then you can run reports and see the status of the project as of that date. It lets you go back in time during the life cycle of your project. So I just think that's very useful to know. What we're going to do is in the schedule group, we're going to click on set baseline and then set baseline. And so we, we want to update the baseline that we already saved. So I'm not going to change to a new one. I'm going to just leave it on that one for the entire project. And then I'm going to click OK at the bottom. So it lets you know that it has already been used. Are you sure you want to overwrite the data? And we're going to select yes. So now if we go back to set baseline, set baseline, you can see it updated its last saved date. So we have a more accurate point to continue tracking from at this stage of our project. To recap module three, we started with executing a project and that was really tracking actuals. So we marked task percentage complete. And we did 100%, 50%, couple of different percentages. We used the tracking table to track actuals. We changed actual durations. We even changed a remaining duration, making a two-day task into a one-day task. You learned about the different fields in the table on the tracking table. And then you learned about how to sync your project plan file with SharePoint. And that when you update a task progress on SharePoint, it flows back down to your project plan. We updated the work on a task. And we also updated costs for a task. We moved into lesson two, which was monitoring our project progress. And we learned how to use the tracking Gantt view. We also looked at the variance table to see the differences between our baseline and where we were. And we also use project statistics to view where we are compared to our baseline. 
After that, you learned how to add custom fields to your project. We added a lookup field for the resource sheet so we could have the departments for the resource. And we also added a lookup and graphical indicator field for our entry table where it could show the progress of a task using flags. We went on to creating a custom view. We did a split view. You learned how to work in network diagram view. And we analyzed our project plan by viewing critical tasks. We looked at both free and total Slack. We actually created a custom table in this section so that we could look at critical task and free and total Slack. We also talked about late task and slipping task. And we were able to view this stuff in a table as well as on the Gantt chart. Then we moved in how to sort and group your task list as well as how to apply filters and or highlights to it. Then we moved on to using task boards and sprint as another way to analyze your project plan. So it's just another way of looking at your task lists. We have them on task boards. We were able to customize the cards. You learned how to use task board sheet. And then we set up sprints, which are time phased overlays on tasks. So we set up one month block sprints and you learned how to use the current sprint board and the current sprint sheet. You learned how to move your tasks onto different task cards and you learned how to assign your tasks to their appropriate sprint. Then we moved into controlling a project plan by editing the task list. We deleted a task and set a deadline task. We then moved into splitting a task that's not on this list here, but we did split a task and we documented the reason for the split as a task note. We added a constraint to a task and we also rescheduled a task to a non-working day, and we had to break its link to its predecessor task in order to do that. And then you learned how to mark a group of tasks as inactive, and then how to reactivate them. And then you learned how to move, how to reschedule a group of tasks for a later date. And because we made all of those changes, we ended up updating our baseline. So we overrode it. In our last and final module, we have two lessons. Lesson four is reporting on a project. So you'll learn how to format and share a chart view, how to view existing reports, how to create custom reports, and how to create a visual report which is really a way of exporting project information either to Excel and or Visio. And then lesson five is where we'll get to customize the application. You'll learn how to change some key project options, how to create a project plan template. So if you're gonna be doing another similar project, you don't have to start from scratch. You'll have a template that you'll be able to work from. You'll also learn how to share resources. I mentioned that you may happen upon a project plan file that only has a resource sheet filled out. And that would be known as a resource pool. And that's how you can share resources across project plans. And then lastly, you'll learn how to link project plan files to each other. We're going to start this lesson by formatting the Gantt chart and learning ways that you could share just that portion of your project plan. So just so our focus is on the Gantt chart, 
I'm going to grab my divider between the chart and the entry table and just drag it all the way to the left. And on the Gantt chart, the first thing I'm going to start with is the Gantt chart style gallery. And so you can use that to change the coloration of the bars on your Gantt chart. And you have a wide range of choices. If you want to see more choices, so you're seeing one row of choices, you can access this arrow, downward pointing arrow on the right side of the gallery with the horizontal line above it. And that opens up the whole gallery. So you can see you have presentation styles and you have scheduling styles. Really, you can use any style that you want at any point. So I am going to just pick a presentation style here and I'm going to go with the orange. The next thing we're going to do is change the font. So the first button on the Gantt chart format tab is text styles. And let's go ahead and click that button. In the text styles box, you'll see at the top item to change is currently set to all. So if I do the drop down next to all, I can see everything that's included on that list, right? So what I want to do is we just want to, ch we want to change the font for everything. We want to make the font size larger. So I'm going to select 12 point for my font size and I'm going to click okay. And so notice it changed the font size for all objects. My row headers are larger. The Gantt chart is larger. My time scale at the top is larger. And if I expand the divider, I'll see that the table looks the same. So now what we're going to do, actually it did get a little bit larger. Let me check here. Yeah, no, the table does not look the same. The table is also 12 point. That's right. It was set to all. And so now we want to do another font type change. So let's go back to Gantt chart format and back into text styles. And this time let's do the drop down next to all. And we will choose summary tasks on that list. And for our summary task, we're going to give a background color. And I'm going to choose just like an orangey color. And I'm going to click OK. So that impacts the table portion, right? Because that's where our summary tasks are showing there. And that's what we selected from the items to change drop down. In addition, you can put drawings on your Gantt chart, all kinds of shapes and things. So on the Gantt chart format tab, the last button is drawing. Go ahead and click it and select text box. Now your mouse looks like a crosshair. And so you can click and hold and draw a text box about that size. And we're going to type Emily can have more than 50% availability if necessary. I'm going to type a period. Then I'm going to click away from the box and then go back and reselect it. And then I can see, I can move it. I have sizing arrows around it. If I want to resize it, I can do that. And then what I want to do is I want to make sure that the text box is pointing to this Gantt bar where Emily Barrington is listed at 50%. So I'm going to go back to the drawing drop down and this time I'm going to select arrow and I'm going to click on the left side and hold on the left side of the text box and just draw an arrow pointing to where it says Emily Barrington. So 
So you can do things like that on your Gantt chart as well. So let's say that you have stakeholders that you need to share your Gantt chart with. We are going to do that next. Go ahead and save your project plan. Now let's make our entry table a viewable again. So I'm going to just grab my divider bar. And really, we just need to see the task name columns at this point, up through task name. And what we're going to do is we're going to, in this scenario, we're going to say that we need to share stage one with our stakeholders. And they want to see the Gantt chart portion, not the table. So what we're going to do is in your task list on the entry table, I'm going to include task zero. I'm going to just click and hold on row heading zero and drag down until I have row 22 selected. So that's all of stage one as well as task zero. And now that I have those selected, I'm going to drag that divider bar backwards so I don't see any of the table anymore and just my Gantt chart. And so before we do this, let's go to the view tab and in the zoom group, make sure your time scale is set to weeks. So it will look like how my Gantt chart looks on my screen. And what we're going to do is go to the task tab of the ribbon. We're going to do our copy drop down and select copy picture. This time we're going to save the image as a GIF image file. So we're going to do that option button and then navigate to wherever you want to save the file. Um, it might automatically want to take you up to your SharePoint site since we synced this to SharePoint. And at that, at this point, you can just put it on your local computer if you like. And then we're going to say in the copy group, we're going to leave it on selected rows. So all of stage one and task zero. And then for the time scale, we're going to leave it on as shown on screen. And we're going to click OK. So I've navigated to my local directory and I've opened the GIF file and this is what it looks like. And so this is a picture. I can put it into a PowerPoint presentation, Word document, email. I can edit it and get rid of, because even though we had the table hidden, it still shows the row IDs in the information column. I can crop it. I can do all sorts of things with it and then share it with my stakeholders. And we can go ahead and close that file. Now we're going to use the built-in reporting tools by going to the report tab of the ribbon. And you can expand so you can see your entry table again. And you can deselect those tasks. So on the report tab of the ribbon, we'll start in the view report section. And what I normally do here is we just do a grand tour of all of the reports and all of the categories of reports. So we're going to start like that. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to click on dashboards and we're going to look at the burn down report. Now all of these reports are highly interactive. They're also very descriptive. So it's showing the entire life cycle of the project up here. The name of the report, these are just text boxes, which means you can modify them, you can delete them. It comes with two charts. On the left, you have your work burned down and it gives you a description, shows how much work you've completed and how much you have left. 
if the remaining cumulative work line is steeper, so that would be a blue line here and we don't have one, then the project may be late. And then you have a task burn down, shows how many tasks you've completed and how many you have left. If the remaining task line is steeper, which is the orange line on that one, then your project may be late. So it's fine, it's not steeper. So that is an example of a burn down report. Now, as we go through the tour of the reports, I'll point out several things. We'll actually modify some of the default reports as we go. One of the things I wanna point out is this. If you click in a blank area of your report and you look up at your ribbon, you have that report design contextual tab. Now click on your burn down text box. And in addition to the report design tab, you get a shape format tab. Click on your work burn down chart. Now you have report design, chart design, and format. So depending on what object on a report you're working with, the appropriate contextual tabs will show up on the ribbon. We'll talk about the field list that just popped up on the right separately. Now we're gonna go back to the report tab of the ribbon and back to dashboards. And this time let's choose cost overview. So this report comes with two charts and a table. It has the name of the report, the date range of the project life cycle. You get a box here, which is actually a table showing the cost and the remaining cost and percent complete. Underneath that you have a table, the cost status table, only for your top level tasks, showing the name, actual and remaining costs, baseline costs, cost and any variance. You have a progress versus cost chart on the right. And again, with instructions, if percent complete line is below the cumulative cost line, your project may be over budget. And then you have a cost status chart for the top level task showing remaining actual and baseline cost. Now, the field list on the right side of your screen, you can use that to change what shows in any of these report objects. So let's click on that cost status table to select it. And if you look in the field list, you'll see that the fields that are showing in that table have check marks in them. And there are different categories of fields. So we have your ID name and resource name at the top. Then you have your cost fields, includes all your baselines. You have your custom fields here. These are more cost fields actual cost, cost, cost variance, remaining cost, right? And so we're not using any date fields in there or duration, flag, number, work, or other. And underneath all of the other fields that are collapsed, you'll see the fields that are in that table. Underneath that, you'll see it says filter, all tasks, group by, no group, and outline level one. Outline level one are your top level tasks. So we're gonna do the drop down arrow there, and we're gonna select all subtasks. We wanna see the cost status for all of the subtasks. So now the table has expanded and all of the subtasks are in there. And then if you were gonna keep that that way, I would change 
the text box above because it says cost status for top level tasks. And I would just put for subtasks. Now let's select that table again. I just want to click anywhere in it to have it selected and go up to the table design tab on the ribbon. And we can give the table a different style. So I'm going to use that more button on the right of the table styles gallery to open it. You'll notice that there are light, medium and dark styles. They give you styles at the top that are a best match for this particular document. I'm going to go with a medium orange style. with banded rows. So light, dark, light, dark. And then click on your cumulative cost chart, just somewhere in a blank area of the chart, go to chart design. And to the left of the chart styles gallery, there's a change colors tool. And I'm going to just try it. I may not like the color once I apply it. And I don't like that color. So I'm just did control Z, which is undo. And I decide I'll just leave these charts alone. So if we wanted to see what this report would look like, if we were going to print it, right, we could go to the file tab and just choose print and you'll see your print preview. And this is where you'll learn that you may have to change margins so on and so forth. It's generating 10 pages of this report. So you can see that that table, obviously, since we did it for all subtasks is expanding over several pages and then it's creating some blank pages. So when I go to the back arrow to get out of there and I look at the report design tab on the ribbon, I can get to in the page setup group, I can go to orientation and maybe make it portrait. I don't think that's going to do any good, but I could go to page breaks and then you're seeing the page breaks on the screen, right? So I know where that table is breaking and what I might choose to do is something like move the table to another page. So you may have to manually massage your stuff to get it to look right. If you're going to be printing the report, Let me just put it back where it was for right now. You can also change your paper size here and that might help with some of them. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you take that table back to just showing your level one task, your top level task. And one other thing that needs to be done here, this is why, um, with the exception, and we adjusted that table back, but this is why it's generating more pages because of these charts on the right, I'm putting them inside that margin there so that it won't be bleeding over to another page. And now if we go to file print, We're still getting a blank page there. I'm getting one of two pages. Oh, because this, this text box, I can see it bleeding over. So just have to go back and clean it up a little bit more. So it's the text box above this table that's going over there. And I can kind of leave this one alone. So that way, if you need to print your report, you can do it that way. Now, the other things that you have on that report design tab are important to review as well. It's very rare that I actually print out the reports. Let's take a look on report design tab. In the report group, you have manage, which is you can rename your report here, or you can get to the global organizer, which we will cover later. 
or you can copy the report. So when you hover over copy report, it says copy it so you can paste it into another application like Word, PowerPoint, or even Excel. So a lot of times I'll do the report as it just paste it into a Word document or PowerPoint or something like that. So you can test that feature out by clicking copy report. So now I've switched to PowerPoint and I'm going to just do a blank presentation here. And I want to go on the home tab to the new slide drop down and choose blank. And then I'm going to right click on slide one and delete it. On the blank slide, I just have my guides showing on the slide. And if you want to see guides, you can go to the view tab and check your guides in the show group. And I'm going to just right click and I'm going to look at my paste options. I can use the destination theme. So if I th had a theme in this presentation and I wanted the report to look like that theme, I would choose that option. We just have a blank presentation with no theme. I can keep the source formatting. So the way that it's formatted from project, or I can copy it in as a picture. I'm going to use picture and then I can resize it. So it actually fits on the slide. I'm using the bottom right sizing handle and I'm going to just size it. So it fits better on that slide. And then I would do another new blank slide and put the next report in and send the presentation out or conduct the presentation with the reports in it for my stakeholders. Another group on this report design tab is the insert group. So we'll revisit this group when we develop a custom report where you can insert images, shapes, charts, tables, text boxes onto it. And we'll visit the theme section at the same time because you can apply a theme, which is a series of colors, fonts, and effects to your report to make it more visually appealing. So for right now, we're going to go back to the report tab and back to the dashboards drop down, and let's view the project overview report. So this one has your percent complete, and then it has milestones that are coming soon. So these are our milestone tasks that are coming soon, right? Listed in a table form. We have a status for all of our top level tasks or our summary tasks, percent complete, right? So stage one is 9% complete, stage two, 10%, our other stages are not. And then we have late tasks because we have a project deadline, a deadline task in there for some reason set for 620. I might've done that by accident. This is another good report that can be utilized throughout your project. And now we'll go back to report dashboards again. We have two other dashboard reports, upcoming task and work overview. Let's look at upcoming tasks. This is one that I like to use pretty frequently, right? Um, again, it shows the percent of work complete, the status of remaining tasks that are due this week with their percentage of completions, and then tasks starting soon. And that's the status of tasks that are starting in the next week, the following week. This is a really handy report to keep an eye on. And we'll go back to report dashboards and work overview. So this one, it has, you've already seen the work burn down report on the burn down report, right? It has that chart there. It has a work stats chart, actual remaining and baseline work for all of our stages of our project. It's giving you the percent of work complete, remaining work and actual work. You have your resource stats chart on the left. So actual and remaining work per resource. And then you have remaining availability for all of your work resources. So these are just work resources here, not material or cost. 
And let's go back to report dashboards one more time. So down at the bottom, it's kind of misleading. It says more reports. But if you click on more reports, it's just showing you the categories and there are no other dashboard reports, just those five that we've looked at. So you can cancel out of there. And our next category of reports are resource reports. You see, we have two over allocated resources. This is another way of looking at them, right? So you can see, and we still have some over allocations in our plan. So you see the work status for over allocated resources in the form of a column chart. And then you have your over allocation chart, right? So the orange lines are over allocation for Teresa Brown. We have some for Anita Redman. You can look at the legend at the bottom of that chart. And we'll go back to report, resources, and resource overview. You saw the resource stats in a previous report. And here's our work status, the percent of work that's been done by all your resources. And then you have your resource status in the form of a table as well. And we can go back to the report tab. The cost reports are pretty important here. So if, if you're tracking cost in your project, these are the reports that you can share with your budget people. And so we have a cash flow report. Let's take a look at that. So you're seeing your actual baseline and remaining costs as well as any variance. You have a chart and it tells you this chart shows the project's cumulative cost and the cost per quarter. To see the cost for a different time period, select the edit option from the field list. So what that means is select that chart and I'm going to get rid of this format plot area pane. That's what happens when you kind of double click a chart and in the field list, up at the top, it says select category and it's set on time. And then there's an edit button. Click on edit and see that it's defaulting the quarters. Do the drop down for quarters and choose weeks and then click OK. So now you see the chart updated. And if you were going to keep that update, then you would want to change the text here. If you're going to keep the text box and say cost per week. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to edit and we're going to change it back to quarters. And I think we had, I'll just do a Q1, Q2 format. I think that's what they had in there and we'll click okay. So yeah, you can change that. It, I love the informational text that's given on the reports and, and a lot of times I'll leave them there when I'm sharing reports for stakeholders because they explain to them what they're looking at too. And then you have the data at the bottom in the form of a table and it includes a couple of other fields. So you have your remaining and actual cost and then your cost field, ACWP actual cost of work performed. Then you have budgeted cost of work performed and budgeted costs of work scheduled. And we're going to go back to the report tab. And now we're ready to look at our cost overruns report. So you get a task cost variance, the cost variance for all your top level tasks, resource cost variance, and then you have supporting tables and we don't have any cost variance. So the charts are not populated but you have supporting tables for task costs and resource costs. We can go back to report cost earned value report. So we don't have a lot of data in our project plan right now. So we have our EAC is estimated at completion, actual cost of work performed and budgeted cost of work performed values are showing. Then you have your earned value over time chart, which is not, super populated right now. 
You have variance over time. It's showing cost variance and schedule variance. And indices over time. You have your schedule and cost performance indices for the project. So again, we haven't tracked very many actuals in our project plan. So at this point, a lot of these charts are not going to be super populated. We can go back to report cost, resource cost overview. So you see your cost status for work resources, the cost distribution over the different resource types. So most of the costs are work resources, which is pretty typical. And then you have your cost details for all of the work resources. And we're going to go back one more time to the cost. And you have your task cost overview. So your cost distribution based on the status of a task. And this chart is kind of, I'm going to move this text box out of the way so I can see it. So you have your legend at the bottom. Um, we have very few tasks that are marked complete. I'm going to move this text box out of the way as well. It's kind of, yeah. So, and then you have on schedule and most of it is future task. We have our cost details table. Our next category on the report tab is in progress. Now these I would access more often than perhaps some of the others. So we've talked and we've seen like on the Gantt chart and in different tables, how to view critical tasks, late tasks, milestones, and also slipping tasks. So let's look at the critical task report, right? So remember, if you have a highly sequential task list, a lot of your tasks will be on what's known as the critical path, meaning that there's really not a lot of wiggle room for it to slip without pushing out the project end date. So these are a list of our critical tasks might want to keep a careful eye on them in terms of their start dates and how they're progressing. We're going to go back to reports in progress, late tasks. Well, I've got that project deadline of the project start date up there for some reason. So that is actually late now. Hopefully you won't have anything that is late at this point. We're going to go back to in progress our milestone report. So late milestones, milestones that are due this month and milestones that are 100% complete. And then you have it in the form of a chart on the right. And one more time to in progress and slipping tasks. So where the finish date is past the baseline finish date, we haven't gone that far in our project tracking actuals to have any slipping tasks. And you can go back to your report tab. Now back on the report tab, I'm going to skip getting started custom for right now. If you look at your recent drop down, you'll see the caught, you know, in the last one you were on is at the top of the list. It stores like maybe five there or six. And then because we set up sprints and created task boards, we can go to view board reports. So let's click on task boards and go to boards task status report. This is kind of meaty, nice one. So task by board status. So we have our not started in progress and done boards. We have our remaining tasks chart, remaining tasks by resources. And then we have a table on the right, which is your task summary, the summary task name, the name of the sub task, resource name, and the board status. Let's go back to report task boards and let's look at boards work status. So this one has your remaining work by task board remaining work by resource, 
remaining work over time, the number of hours of work that I've completed and the number of hours left, and then remaining tasks, all of the tasks in task boards that are not marked 100% complete. We're going to go back to report, task boards, current sprint task status. And so some of the same, you know, remaining tasks, remaining tasks by resource. We're going to go back again. Current sprint work status. Just showing it by sprint as opposed by your task board, although it does have the board status in this table. And we'll go back again and we'll do sprint status. So now this is focused squarely on the sprints, task per sprint, work per sprint. And we can go back to report. Now let's look at the getting started category on the report tab. So some of these are not really reports. Let's start with best practice analyzer. So this is actually a report, right? It shows remaining work, tasks that have no actual work, unassigned work, tasks with no resources assigned, tasks with durations less than eight hours, and summary tasks with assigned resources. So out of that group, getting started, this is a report. Let's go back to report, getting started, and click on create reports. So this is more of like a tutorial for you. It's guiding you through, like you can go up here and click on welcome, Welcome to project. You can go through this. You can start and go how to organize your tasks. And then you can go next and all about creating reports. And then next, all about how to share with your team kind of thing. So that's not really what I consider a report. It's a tutorial. We're going to go back to report, getting started. So Create reports, get started with project, organize tasks, and share with your team all lead you to this same tutorial. So they're not actual reports other than the best practice analyzer. Now we're going to go ahead and create two custom reports. So on the report tab, once you create a custom report, then it will show under custom. But to create one, you're going to start with the new report drop down, and you'll see that you can create it from blank with just a text box on it. You can have a chart, a table, or the comparison one has a chart and like a table on it. We are going to choose the table template there, and we're going to want to give this report a name, and we're going to call it resource info and click OK. So now it gives us the text box with our name in it, the name of the report in it. It has a table and it picks certain fields to put in it. So in this case, name, start, finish, and percent complete. We're going to use the field list to change the table to the fields that we want. So we are going to keep, first of all, we in the field list is showing the tasks. We need to click on resources and we'll see that name is selected and we're going to leave that selected. And it also has the date category expanded and finish and start are selected and we're going to deselect those. And we can collapse the date group. We are going to go to the other fields expansion arrow and expand it. And under custom there, we're going to select group. And that's that free field that we use to say whether the resource was internal or external. We can collapse other fields now and we're going to expand the number category 
And under number, we want to check max units. And lastly, we're going to expand other fields again. And then right underneath other fields, expand custom. And we're going to check department which is our drop down, our lookup field that we created for the resource sheet view. So we have our table set up. This is the information that we want. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the text box to the left. And I'm going to move the table underneath it. And in that field list, I only want the table to show our work resources. So the lower half of the field list where it says filter, you're going to do the drop down and select resources dash work. So it's only showing our work resources. Now for that table, I'm going to format it a little bit. I want the names to show where I don't have to have a word wrap going on and the same for the departments. So I'm just resizing those columns. And we want to add a chart. So I want to make sure nothing is selected. And on the report design tab of the ribbon, you're going to click on chart. And on the left side, we're going to select line. And we'll use the 3D line chart, the last one at the top. So you can double click it or click it once and choose OK. I'm going to move the chart so it's to the right of the table. And in the field list, we're going to start by removing the fields that are currently in the chart and they're expanded in the work. So we're going to uncheck remaining cumulative actual and remaining cumulative work. And then we're going to go to the resources tab at the top of the field list. So the first one we want, it already has name selected in that select category. Name is already there. So we're going to expand cost. And we're going to select cost. So it's showing all of the resources and on the line, the 3D line, it's showing their cost. And we notice down here, this filter is for all resources. We want the material and the cost resource included. So we have that set up. Now with the chart still selected, go up to the chart design tab of the ribbon. And you can use the more button to open up the chart styles gallery where it's only a couple. So that's not going to work. We don't need to do anything there. We could go to change colors and I'm going to pick like an orange color. Or colorful. It's blocks of colors. So let me try this one. Yeah. So I picked one so it looks a little orangey in the chart. And then I'm going to select my table by just clicking in it and go to the table design tab at a ribbon. And I'm going to give my table a style that kind of matches the chart. And that's kind of how that goes. So you successfully created a custom report and we're going to do another. Our second custom report is going to focus on our sprints. So I'm going to go back to the report tab, new report, and we'll base this one off of a table as well. And this one we'll call sprint info and click OK. So it does the same thing. It gives us the text box with what we named it and a table with some fields in it. We're going to make sure the table is selected. And in the fields list on the task tab, we're going to uncheck the finish and start dates. And we're actually also going to uncheck and then I'm going to collapse that date category and we're going to uncheck percent complete under number. 
and you can collapse the number category for now. So we have the name of the task. And right now, if you look down at the very bottom of the field list, the outline level says project summary. That's why we're only seeing task zero. We're going to do the drop down there and change it to level one for right now. So we get to see our stages. We're going to expand the date category. And off of the list, you're going to choose sprint start and then sprint finish. And the reason why the dates are showing as non applicable is because we're looking at our stages and you don't assign your summary task to sprints, only the subtasks. So we're going to go down and change our outline level to level two. And you'll see the ones that are in a sprint or populated in a sprint, you're getting the start and the finish dates. And we really don't want that level of detail in this report. We really want essentially the start and finish dates of the sprints. So the bottom of the field list, we're going to go to group by where it says no group and we're going to choose sprint. So now our table is just showing the sprint and their names and their start and finish dates, which is what we want. Now we're going to create a visual report, which is our last section in this lesson. And a visual report, you notice on a report tab, it's in the export group. It's a great way of getting data from your project plan file into either Excel and or Visio. So we're going to be utilizing the Excel visual reports. Let's go ahead and click on visual reports. And at the top, you can say, you see where it says show report templates created in and they have Excel and Visio checked. We're going to uncheck Visio. So we're just looking at all of the Excel reports. So there's tabs underneath. We're looking at all reports. If you want to look at them by category, you have the categories there. We're going to select the baseline cost report. And at the bottom, we're going to click view. And what it's going to do is it's going to export the data and it's going to open Excel for you. So it opens Excel and it put the data in, in the form of a pivot chart. So you're on the chart page. Notice there's two tabs in Excel, chart one and assignment usage, and that's the actual pivot table. So if your finance people are using a lot of pivot tables in Excel, this is a great way of getting the budget information to them from your project plan file. And so it's showing the baseline cost, the act, the cost and the actual cost. So it has that legend at the top of the chart, right? So the baseline cost is the darker purple cost is the one next to it. And you can barely see actual cost in stage one. And I'll show you how to change that in just a moment. And then it's showing your stages down at the bottom. Now you have these gray tabs on uh, your chart and you can use them to filter and everything, but typically they don't need to be there. So if you look at the pivot chart, analyze tab on the Excel ribbon, the last button is field buttons. You're going to do the drop down and choose hide all. So all of those gray buttons disappear from the chart. Now we're going to address how to make this so that you can actually see that actual cost. It's value is so much lower than the other values. You can barely see it in stage one. So we're going to go up to the design tab on the ribbon and on the design tab, the next to the last button, is change chart type. And what we're going to do on the left side is we're going to make it a combo chart. 
So we have our clustered column for baseline cost and cost. And the actual cost is going to be shown in the form of a line. And we want it to have a secondary axis because its number was so low compared to the numbers for baseline cost and cost. We want it to have its own separate axis on the right representing its range of values. And we're going to click OK. So now you can see your secondary axis on the right side. Because some of them haven't started yet, right? Some of the stages, your actual cost is like at zero. And the next one up would be 50 and so on. Whereas this on the left side is showing 5,000 up to 35,000. So it's good to have a secondary axis when your number ranges are extremely variant. Now, the other thing we can do with this pivot chart is let's scroll down the field list and you'll see it only has value fields on there. We're going to scroll down until we see type and we're going to check type. So now it's showing the type of resource at the bottom of the chart. So one key thing to mention here, I mentioned that it's a good way to export some of your project data to either Excel and or Visio, but it is not a live link. So if your finance people are interested in getting these pivot tables and pivot chart reports from you, maybe you can work out the frequency that they would need them and do the export from visual reports once a week or on whatever schedule as necessary. These are now two independent data sets. So you can go ahead and close Excel. And when you're back in project, you can just close the visual reports dialog box. Now we're up to our last lesson in this course, which is customizing the application. We'll be reviewing and changing some project options, creating a project plan template, learning how to share custom items that we've created, how to share resources, and how to link a project plan. So to get started, we're going to go to the file tab of the ribbon. And all the way at the bottom of the band on the left, we're going to click on options. So for any of the Microsoft programs you're using, you should become familiar with their options. They're all on the file tab because that gives you a way to further customize the program for your particular needs. So you'll notice on the left of the project options dialog box, you have different tabs. We are currently on the general tab. So just some examples, I'm not going to go over every option with you, but you'll notice under the project view, the default view is Gantt with timeline. So when we started our project plan file, it brought us to that view with the entry table on the left, the Gantt chart on the right and the timeline visible beneath the ribbon. So that is the default view. If you want a different view to be your default whenever you go into project, you can change it there. You can also control the way dates are formatted in project from there. The next tab we're going to go to on the left is the display tab. So here you'll notice that you have currency options for this project and it gives you the name of your file, right? Some of the options are only for the current file. Some could be for the current file or all project files. And you'll see that shortly. If you always want to have two decimal places, you can change that here or leave it the way it is. If you want a space between a currency symbol and the number, you can change the placement there. Let's go to the schedule tab on the left. If your week does not start on Sunday or your fiscal year does not start in January, this is where you would want to change it. Now for this one, it says calendar options for this project. And this is an example where you can change it for all new projects 
or just for this project. We're going to leave it on the training rollout initiative. If your default start and end times are not eight to five, you can change them here. All of these things can be changed. So there's something else here, scheduling options for this project. When we first started this project plan file, new tasks by default were manually scheduled. We changed it to auto scheduled at some point. But if you want to change all new projects, if you do all new projects, you can see the default there. You could change it there to auto scheduled if you should want to. We're going to leave it and go back to training rollout initiative. So we talked about when we scheduled our tasks, the difference between scheduling it from the start date and the end date. And when we went into project information, it was defaulting to start date because that is the default. There are some other things that you need to look for. Let me look at a couple of other things on this schedule tab. And I think we're good for schedule. On the left side, let's go to the save tab. So what's important here, if you want it to auto save every 10 minutes or whatever amount of minutes, you can do that here. It gives you your default file location. So where, when you're saving project plan files, if you want to change that, you can. And then it has where save templates default personal templates location, all personal templates need to be saved in this custom office templates folder, which is under your documents folder on your local drive. So you want to make sure you save your templates there. If they're not saved there, you cannot access them from within the program. And then lastly on the left, let's go to advanced. So, you know, when we started our project plan, as soon as we used the blank template, the first thing we did was go to project information so that we could set our project start date. You can have it prompt you for project info for new projects, if you'd like, by checking that box. We've noticed a couple of times when we went to schedule a link task on a, on a Saturday, the planning wizard came up and that's happening because of these check marks here in the planning wizard section. If all of your resources on your project were getting the same default standard and or overtime rates, you could fill them in here and then they would just populate on the resource sheet. And then I'm going to scroll down to display options for this project. So you notice when we put in a three day task, it says the word day. Well, you could change that. You might want it to just have a D that shows or a DY. You can have it now to show project summary task. That's task zero. That is checked here for this project because we made it show. If you go to display options for this project and do the drop down next to training rollout initiative and go to all new projects, right? You could then make sure that it's going to show the project summary task for all new projects if you want it to. I'm going to change it back to this project. There's one more, one more. So the very last one on advanced is tasks are critical if Slack is less than or equal to zero days. Okay. So we talked about critical tasks in a highly organized sequential task list. You're going to have critical tasks. And so if you don't want as many to show up, you can increase the amount of Slack here for it to be tagged as a critical task. And I'm going to just click OK to get out of project options. You may have noticed when you're in a report, your view indicator on the left is not active. It just simply shows the name of your report. And we want to get back to Gantt chart view. So on the report design tab, they have Gantt chart as the first button. And we can click the upper half of that to get back into Gantt chart view. 
Now we're going to play a little bit of make believe here. We're going to make believe that we pretty much completed this entire project. All the tasks have been completed, so on and so forth. And now we want to save it as a template because next year in June, we're going to have another training rollout. And this one works so well, we don't want to have to build another project plan from scratch. So in order to do that, we're going to go to the file tab and we're going to click on export on the left. Under export, you're going to choose save project as file. And on the right side, it gives you all these file formats and we're going to select project template. And then you're going to click on save as. Now, when you do that, it should take you to your custom office templates folder if that was set in project options. But I will say that there has been a glitch where sometimes it doesn't do that. So you need to navigate to your custom office templates folder if it didn't take you there. And we're going to change the file name to just say instead of initiative, we're going to put template. And notice the save as type right underneath it is a project template. And we're going to choose save. So when you do that, the save as template dialog box comes up. You're about to save a file as a template. You can choose to remove the following data items from the template. So we would want to remove the values of all the baselines because this is for a future date and time and we'll want to set up our baselines when we start working in that plan file. We probably want to get rid of actual values. Your resources may change, so you want to get rid of your resource rates. And we didn't have any fixed cost in here. The fixed cost would be something like if you're doing a remodel project or something and you buy an aquarium, how much did that aquarium cost? And that is just a column that you can put in any table to enter a fixed cost. So we definitely want to strip out the first three. You might as well check fixed cost because usually it would be those. If you've been using the project web app, you might want to remove the data about whether they've been published from the template as well. And we're going to choose save. So now what we're going to do is we're going to close the template. So I'm going to use that bottom X in the upper right hand corner where I'm trying to draw an arrow right now. <laughs> You're gonna use that bottom X to close the template. If you don't close the template, what happens if you just start filling it out, you're actually updating the template itself. So you want, just like any other template, right? You wanna be able to access the template and it turns it into a plan file and the template itself is not being impacted. If you do need to change the template at some point, you can go to your custom office templates folder and open it from there. And then in that way, you're directly changing the template. But to access it, you're going to go, when you closed out, it took you to the new tab. And if you look right above where it says search for online templates, you have an office category and you have a personal category. Click on personal. If you don't save your template in custom office template, you won't have a personal category there and your template won't be there. So now what you're going to do is go ahead and click on the template. And when you select it, you can give it a start date from here, but we're just going to leave it the start date on today and we're going to go create. And so if we go to resource sheet view, for example, you'll notice that we stripped out the rates for our resources. And then you can go back to Gantt chart view. So this template, you might have different stages or shorter stages, you can modify it, but you don't have to start from scratch. 
Now, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to save this project plan and put it w in whatever directory you need it to be in. Let me just navigate to where I want it. And you're gonna name it Training Rollout Initiative 2023. And then you're gonna close it. So now I'm going to show you how to share your custom objects with other project plan files. We created a project calendar in here, a custom view, custom table, and a couple of custom reports, as well as some custom fields. So I'm going to show you how you can make those things available or some of those things available to all of your project plan files, new or existing. And we do that by going to the file tab of the ribbon and on the left side, clicking on info right there, you'll see an organizer button and it says, organize the global template. Let's click on organizer on the left side of the organizer screen. You have your global template. So in this case, these are all the views that are included with Microsoft project on the left side. And you'll see at the top, there's several tabs and it defaults to the first tab, which is the views tab. On the right side, you will have the views that are available or being utilized in your particular project. And so what we're going to do is we want the Gantt with task details view, the split view that we created to be available in all project plan files, new or existing. So we're going to click on it on the right side and then in the middle of the screen, do your copy button. And you'll see that the Gantt with task details is now part of the global template. And then we're going to go up to the reports tab and on the right, we have our two re custom reports. So I'm going to select each one and copy. And then we'll go up to, to the tables tab. And on the right side, we'll select project analysis and copy. And then I've gone to the fields tab. And at the top, I selected resource. We want that department drop down field that we created. So I'm going to do copy. And then we can do the X in the upper right hand corner to close the organizer. And you can do the back arrow to get back into your plan file. Now you're going to learn how to share resources across different project plan files. And so the first thing I'm going to have you do, we're going to leave this training rollout initiative file open. And I'm going to have you open your training rollout initiative 2023 project plan. So you'll have both plan files open. Once that's done, if you go to the view tab of the ribbon, almost all the way to the right in the window group, you'll see your switch windows drop down and you'll see that you have both files open and you can switch between them that way. Now we need to have a new blank project plan file also open. So we're just going to go to the file tab and we're going to click on blank project. And now the project information box popped up automatically. And that's because when we went through project options, there was a setting that says prompt for this box every time you create a new project. So we're going to just cancel that. If it came up for you, you can cancel it. And what we're going to do is go to the Gantt chart format tab and over in the show hide group, uncheck project summary task. And we're going to switch to resource sheet view. And then we're going to save this file and we're going to name it training resource pool. 
So before we copy and paste the resource information into our resource pool file, we need to make sure that the columns are consistent. Remember on our original resource sheet, we added a custom field that we created for the department. We made it a lookup field so it had the drop down list. So this shows you what copying things to the global organizer can do for you. We're in the training resource pool file and we're going to right click on the type column heading and choose insert column and start typing department. All of our custom objects are now available to this file, which is a new file and any other existing project plan file. So you can select department and now we're going to use the switch windows button to switch over to training rollout initiative. And before we copy this stuff, because we have this, these over allocated resources, I'm going to show you a little trick here. If we copy them and paste them into our resource pool, they're going to be red, but they're not going to have the little red people. They're not going to be noted in the system as over allocated, but their red bold font will carry over and you won't be able to change it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go to the resource sheet format tab on the ribbon. And the first button is text styles. We saw this in Gantt chart format. At the very top where it says item to change all, we're going to do the drop down and select over allocated resources. And notice it has that deep red color and it's also bold. We're going to change bold to regular and we're going to do the color drop down and select the black color under theme colors and click OK. And we'll change it back afterwards. But for right now, we're going to select from the first resource name all the way over to their standard rate, making sure all of our resources are selected. And we're going to do control C to copy that information. Go to your view tab and using switch windows, go back to your resource pool, click in the first resource name cell and control V. And notice, like I said, the little red icons in the indicators column. So the system would not have thought that they were over allocated in this file. There's no task. There's just a resource pool, but you would not have been able to get rid of that shading. Even if you had gone to the resource sheet format tab and went into textiles in there, it wouldn't adjust it. So we have this in our training resource pool. Let's go ahead and save this file and then switch back over to your training rollout initiative file. And we're going to go back to resource sheet format textiles and make sure that our over allocated resources show up bold. And then for the color all the way at the bottom under standard colors, I'm going to use that first dark red and click OK. So we put it back the way it was. Now that we have our training resource pool set up, let's switch back over to our training rollout initiative 2023 file. And the first thing we're going to do there is go to the project information on the quick access toolbar. Let's go in there. So this is the file that we created from the template that we saved. And so it kept the original start dates and stuff like that. And we want to change our project start date at this point. So let's do the start date drop down and let's navigate to let's say June of 2023 and let's select June 5th and then click OK. So that adjusted that file. And now the second thing we're going to do, because we created this from the template and we chose to keep our resource information minus their rates in the template, we want to delete everything off of this resource sheet. So I'm going to select 
the gray box at the intersection of the row and column headings to select everything and just press delete on my keyboard. Then I'm going to just click on the first resource name cell and I'm going to go to the resource tab on the ribbon. In the assignments group, you're going to select resource pool and then share resources. So if you were using your own resources, they would be populated on the resource sheet and we just deleted everything. We want to use resources and it says it requires at least one open resource pool. When we select that option button, our resource pool should populate. If not, you can get to it from the drop down. It needs to be open. And then on the bottom on conflict with calendar or resource information, we're going to leave it on pool takes precedence. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. So we'll click OK. So now we have our resource pool information in this project plan file. So let's switch back over to our training rollout initiative plan. And this is the one that has the over allocated resources on its resource sheet. So let me show you why, if you're going to be using a resource pool, you should use it before any work is tracked on your project, before any work assignments are done on your project. You should already have it attached to the resource pool like we just did with the 2023 file. Because if you don't and you try to attach it to a resource pool, when assignments have already been done, when work has already been done, this is what's going to happen. Let's go to the resource tab on the ribbon. And we're not going to delete these resources on purpose. You'll see why in a moment. And we're going to go to resource pool, share resources. So. If we choose to use resources from the pool at this time, we're going to end up getting errors, which you'll see in a moment. But this is a good screen to talk to you about the pool and the sharer taking precedence at the bottom of the screen. So if I have my own resources here, and then let's say no work has started, no actuals have been tracked, and then I decide to attach it to a resource pool, but I don't delete my resources. My original resources are known as the sharer resources. So in a situation like that, it would have a duplicate set of resources. And so if I come in and I update the resource sheet, Depending on what set of resources I'm doing the update in, it could cause a conflict and you could end up with wrong information. So when you're using a resource pool, you want the pool to take precedence. In our other file, we deleted everything on the resource sheet. So everything in there is from the pool. And if we wanted to update any resources, we would do them in the training resource pool file. Since it's attached to the rollout initiative 2023 file, all the updates will automatically flow there. So if we change somebody's standard rate or maximum units, or if there is a name change, if someone marries or something, we can make sure that those changes are consistent across the files that the pool is attached to if we make those changes only in the resource pool file. So I'm going to show you the error that's going to get here. We're going to leave it on pool takes precedence. Go ahead and click OK. So there's a problem. It says resources with the same name, different types. That's not really the issue here, right? Material resources with the names, same name, but different labels. That's not it either. We're going to click OK on that. And so we don't really have to, our list, some of it repeated, right? So this is one of the things, the issues you can get into. So we don't want that to happen. Our posters are on there twice, um, once with the material, once without the material. And so what we're going to do is go back to resource pool, share resources, 
and choose use own resources and click OK. And so now we're just using the resources that we originally had in here. Again, if you want to use a resource pool, do it before you do any resource assignments or any actual work starts on the project, or you could have issues. So for this particular project plan, we're going to use its own resources as opposed to the resource pool, which is unfortunate for us because let's say Emily Barrington's salary gets raised. We would have to update it in two places at this point, but this is a good lesson learned for you. If you're going to be using resource pools. Let's say you're going to be working on multiple projects at the same time. So in our situation, the scenario would be that because we pushed a bunch of tasks back in this project, when we had to reschedule a bunch of tasks, that there might be some overlap between this project finishing and our 2023 project starting. So we would want to be working on the plan file for the 2023 plan at the same time. Instead of having to manage two different plan files, you can create a project within a project file. And we're gonna do that now. You can go ahead and close your training rollout initiative 2023 files and your resource pool file. And I've just switched to Gantt chart view in our original training rollout initiative file. And for this one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna collapse our project. So I'm gonna collapse task zero, and I'm gonna click on the first blank task name cell after that. And I'm gonna go to the project tab on the ribbon and the first group is the insert group and it has sub project there. Go ahead and click on sub project. Navigate to where your project plan files are and you're going to select training rollout initiative 2023. And notice at the bottom, it says link to project and we're going to click insert. So when you do that, it puts it in as like a subtask, a, a summary subtask. And so what we're going to do is when we try to expand it, it lets you know that you have to have the resource pool open. So we're going to go ahead and click OK. And it did that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna rename this one. So training rollout template is what it came in on. I'm gonna double click it to get into, and this is inserted project information. And I'm gonna call it training rollout initiative. And then at the beginning of it, I'm gonna put 2023 and a dash and click okay. So now I can be working on my original training rollout, I can expand it. I can be collapsing stages within it, right? Doing all of that kind of stuff. And then when I need to work on both, I can expand the next one and maybe do some assignments. We don't have resources assigned in the 2023 training rollout initiative. So when I expand it, I'm going to go to its task two. Notice each one has a separate set of row numbers starting over. So that task two, I'm going to go to resource names column and choose Emily Barrington. And so anything that I do in here, will reflect in its original plan, project plan file. So go ahead and save your training rollout initiative file and reopen and then close it. Reopen your training rollout initiative 2023 file and you'll see that change. 
So with the 2023 version of the file open, I can see that Emily is a resource name there and it works both ways. If I do anything in this file, it goes back up to the shared file or the sub project file and vice versa. And you can go ahead and save and close that file. So just to recap what we learned in this last module, we started with reporting on a project. And so you learned how to format and share your Gantt chart view. And then we had a comprehensive tour of each and every existing report, couple of which we modified. We also created two custom reports and then export it to Excel via a visual report. Then in our last lesson, we got into customizing the application. We reviewed several project options. We learned how to share custom objects across project plan files. That's not on the list here. Then we created a project plan template and accessed it to create a new project plan. We learned how to create a resource pool file and how to share resources with other plan files. And then lastly, we learned how to link project plans, which is an efficiency tool. So if you're managing multiple projects, you can be managing them from one file instead of multiple files. Hi everyone, Trish Connor Cato here. I just wanted to officially thank you for attending this Microsoft Project 2021 video course. And just to recap everything that we covered in this course, focused on executing the project. And that's when we started tracking our actuals. We also monitored project progress and learned how to control a project plan. So after we updated our actuals, we view the progress in a variety of different ways of our plan. We went into adding custom fields, custom views, custom table. We learned how to work in network diagram view and how to analyze the plan and view progress by using task boards and defining sprints. We also learned ways to control the plan and that included editing the task list splitting tasks, rescheduling tasks, and we forced a task to begin on a non-working day and updated the baseline. The final module, we learned everything there is to learn about reporting on a project. And then we went into customizing the application by learning about project options, some of which are very useful. We actually formatted our Gantt chart, added a text box to it, learned how to share it before we got into the interactive reports. And then we exported project data to Excel in the form of a pivot table and a pivot chart by creating a visual report. We created a project plan template after learning how to share custom objects using the global organizer. And then we learned how to access our template and create a new plan file based on it. We ultimately learned how to set up a resource pool and then attached it to a plan file, which is the way that you can share resources across project plans. And then we ended up by linking project plan files together for more efficient oversight so that if you're managing multiple projects, you can manage them from within one plan file. Once again, my sincere thanks. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.